It's Wednesday night, and that means it's time for the Lamar Thomas Show, featuring the greatest receiver in the history of college football. Just ask them, Lamar Thomas. I was born in uh, Ocala, Florida. I moved to Gainesville to go to high school. Been recruited probably since the ninth grade, illegally, I might add, by the University of Florida. I, I still can remember Coach Solinger, Don Solinger, coming out to our practice one day. Here it is, this guy comes out in the University of Miami jacket, and, and I, I said, I can't believe that's Miami out here. And, you know, I wanted to go up and say, hey, I'm Lamar Thomas. And, and actually, I, I did walk up to him and I said, hey, Coach, uh, I'm Lamar Thomas. And he said, I know. And that was the start of my uh, relationships with the uh, University of Miami. Had another good block and throw it away to come down here, you'll be on TV every weekend dominating. I thought about it. I said, man, where do I sign? My mom, uh, on Saturday mornings, I would wake up and she'd be holding my hand. I thought she was the weirdest lady in the world. <laughs> but she was holding my hands and she would be rubbing them and saying, one day these hands are gonna make you a lot of money. <laughs> um, she was smart. So now, here he is. The great one, along with co-host Gary Furman of Kingsport.com, Lamar Thomas. Lamar Thomas, we're back. We are back. You are, you are correct, Gary. We are back, and man, this orange looks good, man. Man. You are in Canes, you're a, you're a Canes wear. That's uh, right. Looks like you're having a nice time shopping as usual. Well, you know, they take good care of me. How about that? <laughs> Plus that shirt, man. That looks like a nice shirt. You got the yeah. Ibis. With, he's got yeah, the five yeah. rings. Five rings on it. I don't know if you guys can see it. There you go, the five rings. This is their like their signature shirt. Come on down here now. We'll tell you about the hours as the show goes along. But I tell you what, they told me before the game, on Saturday, they had a line all the way to Mission Barbecue, which, by the way, I have some right here. Hi, Mom. Oh, Dad. Mission Barbecue stepping up tonight. Hi, hi Mom, Dad. I'm not going to eat on camera. I have some pulled pork, so we're good on that. But, yeah, they had a line, and uh, actually on Saturday, they're talking about their, they're going to open at 7 a.m. So we'll talk about those hours, but uh, – uh, it's some great stuff in here, man. They they uh, were generous to me, and I'll probably uh, wear this on uh, Saturday since we're wearing orange. So, hey, why not? All right, so uh, week two of the Lamar Thomas Show, season two, and uh, big week for the Miami Hurricanes. You, you had the spectacular win against mm -hmm. Bethune-Cookman um, that I think you know we'll talk about here and checked certainly checked most of the boxes for me. I'm sure you you feel similar. It was nice to see a couple of those wide receivers stepping up, uh, LT style, kind of, you know, Keyshawn Smith. Did you ever return kickoffs? I don't remember you ever returning kickoffs. That wasn't my thing. I didn't trust those guys blocking. I was not well, trying to get hurt. <laughs> and we had we had other guys that were able to do it. I did it in high school, but um, we had some great returners when I first got to the University of Miami. So there was no need for me to even be back there. But, you know, when any time a guy – is able to do something like that. It's always special. I mean, that's a special type of player, and and you got to give some credos to the to the uh, to the, the special teams coach, and and obviously those guys that are blocking. Yeah, and um, it was Keyshawn's first game really as a full time kick returner for Miami. He he did a couple of them last year, um, but this was his first time full time. And uh, we learned after the fact that he was doing this all the way back to when he was a little kid. And in a minute, I'll show. We got some footage wow. of that, which wow. is pretty cool. We'll show that in a minute. Um, we'll circle back uh, to that topic. 
And then, of course, um, the running game, Lamar, mm -hmm. was absolutely spectacular. And the only thing that really threw people for a loop a little bit were some struggles on defense that were right. unexpected just because of the level of dominance that everybody thought that Miami would have. Well, let's touch on the, on the running game real quick. Uh, you know, that running game, it should have been spectacular against uh, – uh, Bethune, because as you well know, we definitely had better talent, and especially it shows in the in the front lines of offensive and defensive lines, and it, it, especially in the third and fourth quarter when you start to wear mm -hmm. on those guys. So yeah, the running game should have been spectacular, uh, but they did a they, you know something when you when you're supposed to do it, and you do it, then no one has anything bad to say. Now, of course, mm -hmm. on the defensive side of the ball. You know, everybody's been so mad at Manny, including me, about keeping contain. Hell, we're still losing contain. And Mario brought up a great point in his press conference where he was basically saying, you know, in practice, when we rush the passer in practice, you pull up. You don't rush the passer to hit him. And, you know, um, you get in bad habits. And sometimes you, you lose your contain. You lose what you're supposed to be doing. So he said – we're going to start rushing our passers, not our own quarterbacks, but the other guy. Now, the reason why I brought this up was because I was that other guy my freshman year. I was they, – they didn't have Gino back – Gino Toretta back there running the option. They had guys like myself and Willie Williams back there taking the full brunt of some of those 320-pound linemen like Cortez Kennedy or, you know, those guys falling on top of you. But – they got to hit us, and they hit us very often, and they practice tackling. So that's the difference in today's game. All right. Um, let me bring in uh, Bruce Warner, our, um, our our voice of the fan here, and uh, to join the party. And, um, Bruce, you did the post-game show, so uh, you're probably a little tired of talking about what went down at Hard Rock Stadium the other night. But um, I assume that it checked most of the boxes for you as well and all of the Canes Nation. Yeah, well, it, obviously, when you win 70 to 13, it's kind of hard to be negative about anything. But we did mention this in the postgame show. We had Chad Wilson with us. We talked about the defense. Because all in the offseason, you were telling everybody how great it was going to be, but it didn't seem like that against this team. They only scored 13, but they moved the ball up and down the field. They had some third and long conversions, which was pretty scary. But Mario addressed that, as Lamar said, in the press conference. That's got to change. We have to change it. And I think that's what's going to happen this week. Go see it against Southern Miss. Yeah, I, I thought, you know, they were rotating an awful lot. I mean, the, the number of defensive linemen, Lamar, mm -hmm. 17 defensive mm -hmm. linemen played in that game for Miami. And I don't have the exact counts at the other positions, but there was a lot. Uh, you know, I talked to Tyreek Stevenson this week and about that big play that he gave up and Mm -hmm. uh, he knew he screwed up and he relaxed, mm -hmm. you know, he was mm -hmm. in and out of the game. They were rotating and he relaxed, you know, and he lost his edge and his concentration on the game. And he admits it. He says, I have to learn from that. It won't happen again. Um, but it, how hard is it for an athlete, for a, fo a football player, uh, when you, you're not really getting into the flow of the game because mm -hmm. so many guys are playing. Mm -hmm. Uh, it's hard, especially when you're used to, uh, being out there, but you kind of, you know, the, the back in the day, we kind of knew what, how it was going to go. You know, we wanted to face a team like Bethune, which we faced Florida and them uh, and a couple other teams like Lone Beach State, speaking to Chad Wilson, uh, <laughs> where we knew it was stat games. So what you basically told yourself, I'm going to go as hard as I can for a little bit. So I'm going to give maximum effort. I'm going to do everything I can. See, that's the difference. Today's kids are a little different as far as even I know from coaching these guys. They they don't have the same mentality. My Our mentality was, okay, we're going to get in this game. We're going to destroy this team. We're going to put a little bit of good film on tape and let the younger guys play. And that way you didn't have to worry about uh, losing focus because the focus was do your job and do it to the best of your ability, and somebody else will be in to get you in a little bit. So I told Chad Wilson during the Lone Beach State game, I said, hey, buddy, I got my watch on under my wristband. After I get one catch 
or my alarm goes off, I'm gonna pull myself out the game and I have some Gatorade for you if you want some, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I I thought that all the rotation maybe hurt the defense a little bit in terms of yeah. you know continuity, mm-hmm. um, production, and Kevin Steele, the defensive coordinator, and, and Lamar. I'll be curious to get your opinion on this as well. Uh, he basically said, like, I understand what the strengths and weaknesses are of all of our players. And I can make play calls when they're in the game based on those strengths and weaknesses. But, you know, I'm focusing on the game and calling the game. I'm not focusing on all the substitution that we were making, which they wanted to do. They wanted to play a lot of guys in this game. Uh, Mm -hmm. But it affected Kevin Steele a little bit. Uh, Not not an excuse, obviously, but – he wasn't able to tailor his play calls to the personnel as well as I think we will see as the season goes forward. And maybe instead of 17 defensive linemen playing, they get down to seven or eight. Right. In a game like this, of course, you, you, you do use as many players as you can. And that's what you want to do because we all know um, depth is very important. Um, And I've talked about this before. Depth is the reason why we won championships because we had depth. There was no fall off. The guy behind you was just as good. And, you know, let's say 70% of the time the starters would play to 30%, those guys came in and did their job. Um, you know, unfortunately, one of the things I did see in the game that, I, that kind of worried me a little bit is our our linebackers, just a little bit. I, I wonder uh, about them in coverage and can they go side to side? So I'm well, they, they weren't see. able to last year. Right. And I'm, I'm very anxious to see. I love the way the schedule is set up because it gives you uh, almost a stepping stone each week to Texas A&M. Right. So now you go against better competition in Southern Miss and you continue to build. And we'll get to see if those things are really like the linebacks, are, if they really are a weak spot on that defense. Well, I think Gary's articles in the last day or two about Wesley Bissant now – Mm-hmm. Gary, talk about that because it seems to me that that's on uh, Mario's mind to get him more. Like, he's very athletic and he's very fast. Yeah, he's an athletic, athletic freak, uh, a guy that they, that they knew was going to be a good player in this program when they recruited him. And he's on an accelerated right. course. He can help them this year uh, once he knows everything that he's supposed to be doing. And he played very well in the Bethune game. And, you know, like Lamar noted, these, you know, um, Wayman Steed – and Corey Flagg are not real strong going side to side and covering those intermediate passing routes. Mm-hmm. And no surprise, even Bethune Cookman, that was the first mm-hmm. thing they rolled out to start mm-hmm. a new season. They went after those linebackers. And mm-hmm. uh, now you, you got Caleb Johnson from UCLA, uh, mm-hmm. the transfer. He's going to factor in. But, you know, the Saint is one. I think Chase Smith is another one that we should see progressively more of here as the year goes forward. I mean, those are two really talented kids that I'm, I'm sure Charlie Strong is trying very hard mm-hmm. to get ready to play. Yeah, also, yeah, I, would, I thought he said that they had problems in their drops. They were not mm-hmm. dropping back far enough, and they were even mm-hmm. able to get over those guys, and they were chasing after that. But, you know, that's got to change. If they don't have the yeah. speed to play there, they're going to have to get out somehow or other. The young kids – and, and sometimes too, Bruce, when you That's when you're playing a lot of guys, I'm sorry, Bruce. Sometimes when you when you're playing a bunch of guys, also uh, communication becomes uh, a factor. And I think on one of the deep touchdowns, uh, as I was watching the game, there was motion to the right. Um, everybody was staying over to the right. I'm like, where's everybody to the left? And I think it was a communication error there because the safety never came over to cover. Uh, that deep third or that middle, he was kind of on the other side as they threw. I think it was a wheel route for a touchdown. Yeah, and I, I mentioned last week, Lamar, that I was worried about the D line. Those four guys had never played a game together. Mm-hmm. Now, some of the guys that are on the bench may have, but not those four ever. Mm-hmm. It was the first game, so it showed. And, and I think that you're right about the communication and the cohesiveness mm-hmm. was missing. Physicality was there. Everyone right. was there. But the rest of the things that you need, the experience of playing and knowing what this guy's going to do and that guy's going to do, we're missing. And that'll take time. 
And I feel I feel sorry, and Gary. I feel sorry for a team like Bethune because you know they get a big pet, fat paycheck, but it kind of screws them up for their conference. You know they're going to get some money, but you're going to lose two or three, maybe four guys. You know, and on top of that, let's address this also. Band director from the University of Miami. If we're paying Bethune Cookman to come down, how about you take the halftime off and let you know, Bethune earn their money? Come on, man. We don't. I, you know what? I agree with you. Yes. Like you that doing? Bethune halftime show was yeah. way too short. Um, yeah. You know, find a way to have the at worst have the teams stay in the yeah. locker room for an extra minute or two. Uh, tell the band of the hour to shorten their show a minute or two. They band in a minute. Yeah. Band on a minute. Yeah, they were out there for five minutes max. I mean, it was not enough um, uh, Bethune band for sure. And I had the, you know, it's funny, Lamar. I had that exact thought at the game as I was watching. I'm like, what? They're done already? Like, you know. It, hey, it, just so you know, Gary, my senior year, we were playing Florida and m and after I had scored a couple and I was standing on the sideline, I kind of went down to our band and said, hey, be quiet. Let the real band play. How about oh. that? <laughs> <laughs> and that was Florida and them, the marching 100. Which is the Bethune band on steroids. Yes. Like yes. They, they are yes. really something special. Yes. All right. Um, so, Lamar, you've been on coaching staffs at, at, mm -hmm. at Louisville, at Kentucky, mm -hmm. um, obviously other jobs along the way. But game one, mm -hmm. a lot happens. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they there's the old cliche in football that a team improves the most from game one to game two. Take us inside Miami football headquarters this week. Um, let's start with the defensive side. What has this week been like for them trying to correct all the mistakes that came up in the Bethune game that just got masked because of how much better that Miami was? Well, I think from uh, just listening to Mario's press conference, those things will be addressed. And just like you said, Tyreek already knew he had messed up. And I'm pretty sure he was able to hear it from the secondary coach and Coach uh, Mario. Um, the one thing I love about listening to his, his press conference is I know he's sincere about what happened in the game and, and improving upon the mistakes. You know, you get some of these coaches – um, that, you know, they say, hey, we're going to address these things, and they might address it in a passive way, but I'm pretty sure Mario addressed it in his way, his style, uh, and, all. you know, this guy is uh, very elegant in how he speaks, and he's not the same guy I walked to class with back in uh, the 90s, I can tell you that. Um, he's, he's, he, can, he can get his point across, so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure – he made sure those guys understood that, you know, hey, we're not going to be passive about mistakes. We're going to home in on those mistakes and try to get us better because we're building up to other games that are even more important. Uh, talking about positives, um, what I took out of it, what I liked about it, I love Thad Franklin. Man, that kid ran hard. Yes. I don't think he's a short yardage guy. I think he's more than a short yardage guy. I like the kickoffs. You mentioned it before we went on the air. The mm -hmm. kid was kicking them off eight, 10 yards deep in the end zone. That is a major weapon. And I like Jake Garcia, eight for eight, including mm -hmm. the one play, Lamar, where he had to step up in the pocket and he finds Skinner in the seam 20 yards down the field. Those are the guys that, you know, you're looking for to make plays because if God forbid somebody gets hurt, I have a lot of confidence in what I saw from Jake Garcia and Thad Franklin looked really good. Well, Jake Garcia, the highest paid backup in America. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, hey, you know, he's 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 uh, as advertised. Uh, I liked Perry, the running back, mm -hmm. the walk on who's, you know, I, I saw him in practice a couple of weeks ago and I was like, who's 46? Yeah, and, he was, uh, he, he's standing out. And of course, someone asked yeah. him in the press conference, I think one of the one of the early questions was, hey, is 46 on scholarship. And Mario was like, no, he's not. I mean, there's a kid that has, has played in a numerous positions there at the University of Miami since he's been there and he looks pretty darn good playing running back. I can tell you that. So I, I think, school, that's for yes, sure. and, and don't, and don't forget about the, the one kid who had only been there eight days. I don't even know his name. The transfer from oh, Lucius, Lucius. Yeah, Lucius. Well, how can you forget a guy named Lucius? You know what I mean? <laughs> Lucius. Lucius came in and ran the ball good. And, 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 and Walden, 
who actually was wearing number 20. I think that was his daddy's number two. Uh, yeah. That was, that was, uh, I, I enjoyed watching the running game, but you know me, I got to the point where I said, Hey, where's the pass? Where's the pass? I want to, I'll tell you, me. I'll tell you something that's crazy. So you got Terrell Walden's kid yeah. playing running back for Miami, uh -huh. yep. but Frank Gore's kid isn't playing <laughs> running back for Miami. He's that? tearing it up for Southern Miss. That's going to come into that? Hard Rock this weekend. How about That's that? Uh, and he's, uh, you know, after one game, I think he's leading the nation in, uh, in what he does. I mean, he's, he's a complete player. But uh, what I'm hoping is that uh, he continues to get better, except for this game, except for this <laughs> game coming up. But he continues to get better, and I'm sure we'll have enough money to get him on over here. How about that? Well, the funny thing <laughs> is we had a story today on Sport. Uh, dot com with Frank Gore and actually mm -hmm. both Frank, uh, senior and junior. And Frank Gore says, I'll be there Saturday. He says, <laughs> I hope Miami wins and I hope my son has a nice, has a, has fun. <laughs> well, that'll be great. But that, that means if we have, if he has a great game, that means our linebackers are what we are talking about. But I think, yeah. but then I think he realized, like, wait a minute, I just said I want my son to lose. <laughs> and he kind of, and then he kind of like changed what he was saying a little bit. Well, I, it doesn't matter what happens, you know, I just hope he has a good time, you know. And it's that's so a fun. tough one. That's Lamar, a tough we were pretty one. vanilla offensively. In fact, I don't think we threw the ball deep one time. Certainly, no. Smith, Keyshawn didn't get any. Now, I don't know if they're doing now, that on purpose. Now, I could tell you this one of the reasons why we didn't, now we did throw a post pass. Uh, we tried one, but the one of the reasons why we didn't is because Bethune basically played uh, man free or cover three with bail technique. The corners were bailing at the snap of the ball, not allowing you. They were they, they were not going to allow you to run behind them. So it would have been a jump ball. And I think what we decided to do was not challenge those guys and not give our because what you're doing and essentially is you're kind of screwing your quarterback too with the deep throwing all the deep passes incompletions you want to keep his percentage pretty good so they threw a lot of quick passes and obviously they threw it to the tight end and the strepo <laughs> yeah uh we'll have, some, we'll have a couple guests later tonight uh darren crying is going to join us and uh the center kelvin harris is going to be part of the show Ooh. and Kel and kelvin clearly is, is checking out what he's getting himself into because i see he's already popped into the comments over here lamar and he says oh he's only goodness. watching the show for bruce warner <laughs> he's already, he's already that's, my man. LT. <laughs> that's my man that's because he wants some more wings <laughs> he wants bruce to take him out to eat is what he wants <laughs> that guy that guy spent more time in, in at the training table with miss sarah than anybody i've ever known <laughs> it shows yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right, LT, let me circle back to what we were talking about a minute ago. Okay, so okay. so we know defense. They had problems uh, in the uh, intermediate zones mm -hmm. with the linebackers. Um, they had problems with pass rush discipline. Um, Correct. And allowing the quarterbacks to escape containment and get out yes. in the open field. Yes. Okay, how do they – let's take those one at a time because those mm -hmm. are, I think, who you, we agree – were the two biggest issues. Um, mm -hmm. Let's start with the pass rush containment. Uh, mm -hmm. How how do they correct that this week? Well, you just have to stay disciplined. I, I'm pretty sure um, this is something that we've we've talked about uh, last year with Martin with Manny and his defense. Um, very undisciplined. Now, you know, I, again, I really like what Mario said about because it makes a lot of sense. In practice, you're not rushing the passer to to hit him. So you you pull up, you do some things that are that are not in what you're really doing, and you get get bad habits. So I think what he's going to do this week, I feel sorry for the scout team, uh, <laughs> receivers, <laughs> backup quarterbacks that it might be walk-ons. I feel bad. I feel sorry for those guys. They they might go on injury reserve this week. <laughs> So a defensive end is is getting up the field. He wants to get mm -hmm. to the quarterback. He wants to get to the quarterback. So when they say pass rush discipline, Lamar, mm -hmm. um, what do they mean? Well, that's that's when uh, let's say a defensive end, for example, he's supposed to he has this gap which is up the field. He's supposed to get up the field. Well, let's say the tackle decides to jump out and oversets, and he says, "Oh well, I'm gonna go get a sack," and he jumps inside. That leaves a gap that is 
unfulfilled. I mean, I, that and, and let's say that that other defensive tackle is rushing in the same. They're both rushing together in the same gap, and then there's a gap outside. Defenses are predicated on everybody having their gaps. Everybody has gap control. And so when when you get when you're undisciplined and you don't do what you're supposed to do, if it's supposed to be a game where they both go to different gaps, you have to do your job. If you both go in the same gap, then that leaves a gap open. And that's what happens when those guys get a little greedy and they say, well, oh, this guy overset. I got a clear line at the quarterback quarterback steps up or steps to the right. And now it's a huge hole over there. And. We're all up there complaining. Oh, here we go again. Here we go again. <laughs> yep. Well, in this case, it was the quarterback that was going loose. Uh, you remember yeah. back that North Carolina game a couple years ago? Yeah. It was the it was the running backs that were exploiting uh, those yeah. huge gaps. Uh, you know what? Uh, I think it was Jay, it was Jalen Phillips, I believe, that was coming yeah. up the field because uh, he was in his last game, I think, as a Miami yeah. Hurricane. He's looking to like light it up for the NFL scouts and he's just charging up the field and there was nobody home and they just kept running the running yep. backs um, please, right into that please, gap. Please, I, I, please, I, let's I, not bring I, up I North Carolina. Of push from the tackles, you guys. Lamar. I didn't see him Emerson Hunt had, had a little, but I didn't really see them collapse that pocket going into the quarterback mm -hmm. to get these guys out of the pocket and, this, and the defensive ends or the linebackers to get them. They, they, they were hand-fighting a lot at the line of scrimmage. Mm -hmm. We need a better push. I mean, you guys had the push from Russell and Tez and those guys, mm -hmm. but I didn't see it. And, and that's what I said last week. There seems like there's eight guys that are DNs and no true mm -hmm. D-tackles. Mm -hmm. We don't have that girth. We don't have a will right. fork in there. So that's, that's an issue. They've got to fix the interior. I think the ends are going to be great. They right. can run, but they have to have lane discipline, or they need some push from the defensive tackles. Well, right, you, we're I'm, glad you, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because the guy who we, who's going to be coming on, he made a killing on us getting pushed up the middle with Caesar and Sap and all those guys, and the quarterbacks had nowhere to run. Nowhere yeah, to run. They and that's Darren Klein that's going, going to be joining us on the show here momentarily. But first, Lamar, um, you know, Canesware, uh, so thankful to them for stepping up this year and sponsoring this show. Uh, you're in the store. You, you're surrounded by all of the great merchandise they have. Um, they created a, a, a brand spanking new commercial for this show. Uh, let's show it to everybody really quick. Welcome to Caneswear. Family owned and operated since 2010. Caneswear has all the latest merchandise for the Miami Hurricanes, Miami Dolphins, Inner Miami Soccer, and more. Come visit us at our store in Davie on University Drive, just south of I-595, or online at Caneswear.com. Caneswear, the spot Miami fan shop. Nice. I like that. Nice. Uh, unless Brett, said, Brett said we could put a Lamar Thomas show uh, poster or sign in the store <laughs> for people to know about this. He said, so let's, let's do it. He also said he wants Bruce to stop coming in for free Caneswear shirts. <laughs> I, I was going to pay. I was going to pay. Hey, <laughs> Fred hey, knows I got, pay. I'll pay. I got one on right now. This is, uh, <laughs> again, this is one of their signature shirts. And uh, come on in here, man. They got a bunch of them, man. Got the five rings on it, like kind of like Jimmy's uh, boat five rings. Uh, comfortable shirt, man. And I think we're, we're, we're wearing orange this week. Are we wearing orange? Probably. Probably, yeah. Probably. I don't think he's going to wear green. Um, but I was there the other day, too, getting some stuff, my shirt, and one from Dave Lamont. And it was packed in the store, and it was a line down the block. Like you yeah. said, the, the barbecue. It was amazing. And they're going to open at 7 on this Saturday because it's a, it's a noon game. That, that'll that be interesting. Yeah, it was four got, and a half hours before the game. It was packed. They got some good hours here. Get in there. They got some good hours here. Thursday, 10 to 7. Friday, 10 to 8. Saturday, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. So you can come before the game, the game and after, gear and after, and on Sunday, since there's a dolphin game, they're going to be 10 to 5. So you can come get your dolphin gear too here at Canesware. All right, Lamar, uh, we've been talking defensive ends and pass rush, uh, and we've been trying to, you know, explain to everybody what might be going on uh, in Kane's football headquarters this week, what might have been the problem. 
against Bethune, but we've got a guest coming on here that is uh, way more qualified than us <laughs> to uh, to talk about pass rushing and, and defensive end play, and that's uh, former Kane Darren Krein. And uh, Darren, welcome to the Lamar Thomas Show. Great to see you again, and uh, hope you're doing well. well. We'll let you talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, but uh, your thoughts on what you've seen from the Miami Hurricanes so far? You know, I think it's just really exciting to uh, have Mario back there first and foremost. I think he brings an energy and I think he brings something that a lot of people just don't understand. And until you've actually stepped on that field and stepped on that uh, in the Orange Bowl, whatever the case may be, if you if you haven't been a part of the family, you don't know really what it takes. And I think that getting somebody back there that actually has been in those shoes and knows what it's about is a huge win really for you know the University of Miami and all of South Florida because – you guys know as well as I did, as well as I do, when, when we were playing, we were the, you know, the creme de la creme. People were coming to watch us before they were watching the Dolphins. I mean, that's just a fact. We were winning more games than the Dolphins were at the time. And, and you know, we just had a whole lot going on um, that was really good and really positive. But I think he's doing a good job of bringing recruits in um, from other schools. I think he's trying to, you know, fill that roster in. And it's been great to see all the kids that are just committing there that are really high caliber athletes that, you know, they still got to go in and and prove it. But, you know, at least they they, uh, are committing to going to a school that uh, is back up and coming. Hey, Cran, I got to ask you this, man. Why Miami for you? Why did you come to University of Miami? You know, it it was funny. And and you know this as well as I do. When Jimmy was there and you had Jimmy on the phone. Mm -hmm. You'd want to run through a brick wall for him. <laughs> he had that ability. He was so dialed in to the psychological side of young men that you wanted to do anything for him. And honestly, like I started three years at a really big uh, high school here in Colorado, and we won maybe 10 or 11 games the whole three years that I started. And honestly, I just wanted to win. I mean, I watched that 1988 Orange Bowl, and, and I think Jimmy Jones was killed about, you know, five people on the field, literally. <laughs> and uh, that's just where I wanted to be. I wanted to go to a place to win. Um, and it, it was it was just something that it was hard to say, but it was something that uh, I just felt it inside. And, and Jimmy, you know, put a big stamp on that, you know, uh, in talking to him. I mean, you didn't want to be a buff? You didn't want to, uh, you didn't want to run with the Buffalo? Honestly, look, I had I had spent the majority of my life growing up in Colorado, and Colorado was kind of up and coming, but I didn't want to be with an up and coming team. I thought, you know what, if I'm going to go play, I want to play with the best. I don't want to play with, you know, some guys that maybe aren't as good and, and maybe are not going to win as many games as uh, Miami was. Darren, could, did, did you hear what we were talking about, about the D tackles not getting a push up? Because as a D end, you knew you had to rely on the guys that were inside to help you out. Yeah, 100%. You know, when Patrick. Riley was next to me or when I was playing on the right side every now and then and Warren Sapp was, I knew that, you know, there was going to be a ton of penetration going that way. And honestly, like if you look at it in any college game, good defensive ends are built by the tackles that are right next to them. It's not really based so much on, yeah, they can be really good, but you can easily, you know, you can, you can capitalize one guy and keep him in, in a space. But when you got two guys coming off on that side and you're having to account for that tackle and that tackle's getting pushed, it creates a whole lot of problems for everybody else. And having that push is huge and it makes an unbelievable difference. And it frees up those linebackers too, because you don't have bodies on them. 100%. 100%. Yeah. I mean, those guys are working. Those linebackers' jobs are a lot easier. And we never played where we were holding up on anybody. I mean, when Al Golden was running that, that defense where those guys were stopping and, and locking out. I mean, I just, I mean, I just could not even deal with it. Like, I how to do that. Like, do okay. not mention that guy's name on my show. Yeah. <laughs> Al Golden is the defensive coordinator at Notre Dame now. Yeah. Uh, well, you, but, there's a reason why they lost. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Darren, give us a clinic on pass rush discipline. Okay. It, it, it's a big thing here this week because it broke down at times in the season opener against Bethune Cookman. And uh, as a defensive end, like you got after the quarterback as much as anybody. Uh, So when they're talking about pass rush discipline and you guys are pinning your ears back, what other responsibilities do you have? I think you got to stay upfield. I think so many times defensive ends get caught up in wanting to go inside. And as Mm -hmm. soon as that, 
as soon as you step inside a good quarterback or you do that against Charlie Ward and he was paying attention, he's going to break outside. And then I'm going to have to go to the sideline and, and Carmelowitz or Ogeron are going to just rip me a new one. And it's, so that's one of the biggest disciplines that people don't realize is you got to stay up field and you got to turn everything back inside and you can't make it just, you know, you can't keep going up field. Like you got to cut that off at the right time and there's a lot of discipline that people don't realize that people see people and defensive ends not do anything but there's so many elements to it that you actually have to do and do well in order to maintain the integrity of the defense hey, did, did you see orchard this this week we some of those videos that he's putting out <laughs> i gotta try to stay away from Ogeron some sometimes because some of the stuff he's involved in is just not that good <laughs> he's living down here now He's living my heaven. He's, he's, that might be his first mistake. Yeah. Hey, I'm sure he's having fun, but living in, in Miami with 17 million in his pocket. Yeah. 17.1. <laughs> 17. I'll, I'll just take the point one and be good. <laughs> hey, crying, man. Let me let me ask you this. Uh, now, I, if I remember right, Penn State. Penn State. Didn't you score a touchdown? I did. That was, that was one of those games where we had a blitz on where I was coming straight down the side, taking the tackle out. And then the linebacker, and it was Jesse Armstead on, at, in this particular play, would come off my butt. And then I had to go outside to kind of protect the integrity of that lane. Right. And uh, Saka decided just to throw, get rid of that ball. And he just popped it right into my hand. So I was lucky. And the thing about that play that people don't realize when I ran into that end zone, I don't know if you guys remember watching Bewitch when she stopped everything. I honestly <laughs> thought that's what happened. I thought, wait a minute, everything is stopped because the people in the stands were like this. Everybody, and nobody was saying anything. There was 104,000 people and there was not a peep in the crowd. And it's sad all, valley, sad yeah. valley. <laughs> and, and until, uh, I don't know who, I think it might have been Michael Barrow or Kevin Patrick or somebody jumped on my back, I didn't realize that it, like, right. for that two split seconds or whatever it was, it wasn't real to me until somebody actually came and, you know, started uh, celebrating with me. Well, now, you didn't take your helmet off, did you? No, 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 he didn't, he didn't. The reason why I brought that up, because I also thought that it wasn't, it, did, couldn't you have two? Did, a, did another one hit you in the hands or something? Like, I, I, I remember... So. You sure? Oh, you know when something hit these hands, they were they was going right to the end zone. That's I never, I don't think I ever had one that was dropped. To be honest with you, because it not too many times is the ball going to be uh, laid right into a defensive end's uh, hands. How uh, difficult is it for Mario? And I've been saying this the last week or so to get a bunch of new guys that came in to play D line and get them ready to play in unison and play as a group instead of individuals because he's brought four transfers in. But none of these guys had played together last week. This was the fir- that was the first time. Uh, well, your thoughts on something like that? Because you were with your guys all the way through. Yeah, you know, and me and Sap still talk about this. And KP, like, we kind of brought Sap up a little bit because you know Sap was a little bit wild when he first came in. And and okay. honestly, the guy has the best feet I've ever seen of a defensive lineman, and he showed it as a tight end. But when we were bringing him up, like, we had so much time to groom him, and we just made him kind of follow behind us and do everything that we did. And it was it was no different from like when I was there and, and Russell Maryland was there and some of those older guys, Shane Curry were around. Uh, but I think that it does take time. And I think that if you're thrown into that situation, you're always going to want to play. Like the guys that are there now, I think what you're going to selfishly want to do is you're going to try to compensate. Like I, I want to do more because maybe he's not ready or I don't know what he's – his abilities are even though they're all great athletes i think they're just not trusting each other and that's a hard thing to do and it just doesn't come like this you got to have time and you got to have you know the the off season there's got to be the ability to gel a little bit i don't think it just happens but hopefully as the season goes on they can get closer and they can understand each other better and understand how to help each other hey darren what what was it like also the depth the depth. I talk about depth all the time. Depth is what wins us. It's won us championships. Yeah. You were I mean, so afraid of the guys behind you. 100%. 100%. I will say this. Like when, when Rusty, before Rusty got hurt, it was me, Rusty, and Kevin. And it was like this three-way thing mm-hmm. where every practice – Somebody else was, you know, hey, you're sitting this or you're 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 second team because you didn't practice well enough or whatever the case may be. It was this ongoing rotating thing around and it made us so much sharper in practice. I don't think people realize that you had to be on every single day of practice. And if you 
weren't on, you probably weren't going to start. You probably weren't going to play as much. And I think that even if you look at like a Marshall's, like you've had Kevin Williams, Horace Cope, like all these phenomenal athletes. I'm like, how do they figure out how to play everybody? But somehow we just made it work. But honestly, like our Thursday practices were almost nine times out of 10 harder than the games. There were some games <laughs> like Penn State for 85 plays. But still, that Thursday practice, man, you were just you were you were dragging. You were it was hard. It was meant to be hard, but it made the game so much easier when we got there. And people don't realize about how much how much you put in on that practice field uh, to get ready for Saturday. It didn't seem like that happened the last fifteen years, there. It just seems like that was something that just wasn't there. And now Mario's here, and not only all stuff like that, but all the details, the minor details, the attention to detail from him is incredible. And it shows in the recruiting, it shows in the prep, offense, defense, transfers. Yeah. He's a guy, obviously a Jimmy Johnson guy, a Nick Saban guy. That's what this team needed. That's what the school yeah. needed. And thankfully, he's here. Yeah. And and like and, and in fairness, um, I think what ended up happening is that somebody said, we're tired of losing. We're tired of seeing these guys that really aren't family to the – organization and we're going to open up the checkbook because that's really what what did it for mario mario's not dumb like he he knew that if he came down here he wanted to get paid what he should deserve to get paid but even more than that he needed to take care of his assistants and he needed to, and he needed to get the facilities up to stuff and he needed to make sure that the guys were taken care of and i don't think that that was taking place because nobody at the university and this was always like lamar remembers this I remember when I had photos of him to make university of miami like Yale or wherever he came from. Like he was trying to like, you know, put us in all these classes that we had to go to and all this stuff. And it's like, dude, you can't change, you know, who people are based on the fact they're going to a private university. I mean, you gotta, you gotta let people be people. And that's the thing that Mario understands is like when he brings these recruits in, like a lot of these guys are from South Florida or from Florida and they understand a certain culture that is, and you can't make it something it's not. I told hey, Terry, him. How much were you matched up against Mario in practice? You know what, honestly, I think he always – like when I was playing right in for the short time that I was, um, I would line up against him in practice. And, like, honestly, like between him, I never – I didn't become really good friends with him until we both <laughs> were done playing because it's just kind of that offensive defense line. Like, yeah, you like him, but you don't really like him that much. And so when Mario <laughs> played over in NFL Europe and I played over there together, we spent a lot of time preparing for that. And then after that, you know, he was in my wedding party, you know, 20, I mean, 25 years this, wow. this February, he was in my wedding party. And so like, we got, we were really close and uh, it was just you know, a, a good time for us to actually gel together. And I think it's harder when not many offensive defense linemen are friends when you're going against each other every single day. It's kind of like Lamar likes these, but he doesn't really like them. You know, that's like stunning to hear that 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 Mario became best friends with the guy he was going against in practice. I mean, that guy brought it every single day as a player, just like he does as a coach. And him and Lewis would always have a little extra push too. Always, a oh little yeah, extra push afterwards. Like those two were notorious for that. Notorious. And like I'll tell you a funny story. One time, I always I always got stuck going against Lamar uh, Leon Cersei. And one time, mm. Leon, like me and Leon got into it. I wasn't going to back down from the fight, even, although I probably looking back, I probably should have. <laughs> he takes his, he, he, I'm, I was always the guy that was trying to get the guy's helmet off. He had my helmet off and he's coming at me. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> With this, I mean, the guy's enormous. And I, I almost, I almost ran, but I didn't know what to do at that point because he had kind of taken a, a page out of my uh, script and used it on me. But, uh, to him, you know, the next FCA meeting or whatever, he was like, man, I'm sorry I did that. I just got out of control. But we were just so competitive, and we just wanted to win, and we just didn't want to let, you know, our teammates down or lose our starting position or whatever mm -hmm. it may be. We were so competitive. Everything was competitive that we did. Everything. Hey, Darren, there's a name that you haven't brought up yet, man. I, I haven't heard you say this guy's name. What what about Dwayne Johnson? Dewey. Dewey. Dewey, Dewey. Dewey Lock. The Rock, you know what? The Rock was a, a, you know, he was a, he was a really good dude to be around. Like I loved hanging around with him because he was so laid back, he was so easygoing. He kind of liked country music. He kind of liked a lot of the things that what that I liked, and and we hung out a lot. And honestly, I've I've kept up with him over the years, but he's kind of at this A list now, and I'm kind of mm -hmm. here in this high school coaching level, and I don't know that. If I needed something, I could probably reach out to him. And be like, I don't know that he's got any real reason to talk to me other than like, 
What's up? <laughs> he was a great dude, and I'm I'm happy for everything that he's done. And honestly, like, like he would give his the shirt off his back if anybody asked mm. him if he needed. It. Like he's that kind of guy. Like he would say, "Hey, what do you need?" I remember when I was going down to Miami, I was just looking for a place to to before my family got down a place to live, and he was just it, transitioning his way back out to to uh, L.A. and he. He called me up and Danny was on the phone with him at the same time. He goes, Hey, you know, what do you need, brother? What, what can I do for you? And you know, do you need some money? Like we you know it's coming. I'm like, no, man, I just need a place to stay and I just wanted to say hi. But he was already kind of transitioning. That's just kind of the guy he is. He's just uh he he wants to, you know, help and, and be around and be a part of uh everybody's life. And speaking of transitioning, how how did you even get in? How did you transition in from a player to strength and conditioning? Now, I mean, I wasn't in a weight room much, so I don't know if you were in there a lot. When you uh, were but, in there, it was yeah. spectacular. When you were in there, it was quite the show. It was quite the show. Don't forget that now. <laughs> hey, you guys don't know this yet. I think Lamar is the funniest guy that I probably – between him and Donnell Bennett, they were – the things that they said on, like, our Thursday night before a game or Friday night before a game, I mean, are some of the funniest things that we ever did or that I had ever been associated with. And, like, when Lamar was coaching in the AAF and I was in the AAF for Orlando, like, he, you know, we would talk and just, I mean, just being around him. It's just he's a he's a great dude, and, and I appreciate his love for not only the game but for other guys and just to yeah. keep it light and keep it real. So Well, you told me a funny story that I truly forgot. Can you tell him about yeah. when you came well, on your visit? I came. I, I I took my visit on. The, I remember the date is December fifth, nineteen eighty eight. I took my my trip. They wanted me to come down for a game, and it was against BYU. And I'm sitting on the sidelines, and I'm walking <laughs> in at halftime, and I see this number thirty six in front of me. He reaches down, grabs a thing of dirt, and puts it on one on one knee pad, and then he puts it on the other, and then he's got some. He's got some trying to put it on his chest. He's like, I'm gonna walk in, and all these ladies are gonna see me that I played, and they're gonna want to see me after the game. <laughs> he was just trying to go let the ladies know that he's been out there playing the whole game. Man, I was, I was a freshman, I was, man. I was in stitches just you know thinking about that story, you know, 30 years ago. And that like, this dude is really, really interested in the right things. <laughs> That's right. I was a freshman. I was a freshman. I wasn't he was playing, sure. so... always good. It was good. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Awesome. That hey, was an awesome time. Hey, um, hey, Darren, let's just so people have perspective, let's uh talk a little bit about where you've been and what you've done. I mean, you spent from 1997 to 2017 in the National mm -hmm. Football League, 20 years uh in strength and conditioning, 97 to 2009 um with the Seattle Seahawks as an assistant mm -hmm. strength and conditioning coach. Then the Miami Dolphins hired you in 2012 to be their head strength and conditioning coach a job that you held for four years, and then you moved to the Indy Colts. Um, and now you're back in, in, in Colorado uh, at uh, Valor Christian High School, if, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Uh, talk a little bit about all your time in the National Football League uh, and, and what that was like. You know, the thing about it for me is that when I, I got drafted by San Diego and I got hurt and then I spent a little time in Green Bay and um, it ended up you know, getting hurt there, getting released, and going over and playing in NFL Europe, and got hurt there, and like had a bunch of knee surgeries, and I just had a knee surgery three months ago again. And that's my thirteenth knee surgery, and I just wanted to figure out um, how I could help people, and I wasn't ready to give it up yet in terms of being a part of a team. And I think that's the thing that people miss a lot of the times when you play football and it stops. It's one of the hardest things that you ever have to go through because. There's not that locker room. There's not that competitiveness. There's not that camaraderie. Like, those are the things that you truly miss and that is truly, really hard to just say, I'm done with that. So it was a great transition for me. You know, I was going to go uh, and just go back and get my MBA. And then, you know, Daniel Duke uh, was in Seattle and he said, hey, we've never had an assistant up here and we're, I want I need an assistant. So he hired me there and I was fortunate enough to stay up there for 13 years. Um, I was out a year, and I spent a, a year in Green Bay uh, with a buddy of mine. And then in 2011, I was with the Dolphins. Um, you know, for actually, I was actually there for five years, and then two years with the Colts. And then I spent some time in the XFL and in the AAF. But what it was for me more than anything is I wanted to be able to kind of give back because I didn't know a lot of the stuff yeah, that well, um, that uh, uh, some of the people um, you know helped me along. Yeah. I think that's, by me 
uh, being in that position, I wanted to say, hey, look, I've been in this spot. I got hurt. And I don't want this to happen. Great, so I want to try to help you. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's it. You know, it doesn't you know, affect you the same way. What is, is, your, is that high school a powerhouse out there? Um, this is, it's the same high school that Christian McCaffrey went to. Um, and we would, went to the state championship the last two years in a row and got beat by, like, actually my rival high school, Cherry Creek. And so they're generally, you know, pretty good. Um, it's a Christian school, and we got 1,200 students. And out of those students, about 750 to 800 of them are actually athletes. So there's a lot of kids that come here for the athletics and for the – it's a great school for education. It wasn't even here. Uh, it's only been around for 15 years, and it's just been a good opportunity for me to kind of give back. I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to go back to high school. I still have a pretty good relationship with my high school coaches, and I wanted to be able to do that. I was just hoping I could stay in the NFL a little bit longer. But generally, your plan and God's plan is not the same, and so this is going into my third year here, and uh, I feel fortunate. Like, I don't necessarily like the freshmen. The freshmen are hard to deal with because they're just like <laughs> – you try to coach them, and most of them are just – they don't – they're a really tough transition, but I start to like them as sophomores, love them as juniors and seniors, and really try to, you know, create an environment for them that is similar to what takes place in college. And if they're lucky enough to go on and play pros, we have – I think in the last two years we've had 59, uh, 59 D1 athletes uh, go on uh, from here to, to play, you know, various sports from football all the way up to swimming. And so it's fun to be able to work with them and to help them um, – and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy the give back. And it, it's not as, you know, every single day. The thing that's tough about the NFL is from July to January or whenever you're done, it's every single day. Like the players have to stay off, but you're still in on those days. I mean, it's every day. You're either traveling or even on Saturdays. It's a grind. It's one of the biggest grinds that I've ever been associated with. And that was part of it. You get burned out a little bit. You can keep going. But, like, at some point, your family's ruined. There's a lot of issues that take place. And I thought, you know what? My family's in a good spot. And my wife is from here and I'm from here. And so it was easy uh, transition for us. Other than the fact that my my oldest son didn't want to uh, spend his last year here. So I spent two years here basically uh, alone. And then my family's just moved out this past summer. Are you strength and conditioning? Or are you coaching? So I'm the director of performance. So I oversee the strength and conditioning side of all 25 sports that we have here at Valor. Wow. You know, hey, this might be a stupid question, <laughs> but I've, I've always wondered about this. How hard do NFL players work in the weight room? I mean, you got these guys, they're making millions of dollars. Uh, how difficult is it to get those guys to come in the weight room and grind? Well, I think you always have the guys that it's really that it comes easy for them. And you get a lot of guys coming out of college, but the, the weight room is easy for them. But if you talk to their coaches, they don't know what's going on in the field. And it's like, dude, you have all these silos and you're not filling up the football side. So you need to spend more time over here. Get out of the weight room where you're really good at and spend more time on the film or spend more time on whatever the case may be. But the, the athletes that I've been able to deal with, you know, there's a lot of them that are really phenomenal. And there's a lot of them that could have done more that actually probably would have helped themselves. And I think that you got to find that balance and you got to be able to – and thinking about Lamar because Lamar was never really – a big weight room guy, but and, and so, and neither was T. Y. Hilton. T. Y. Hilton really like he didn't want to work really hard. He wanted to do enough, but he didn't want to work really hard. But what I talked to T. Y. about, I was like, "Hey, man, let's just take care of your legs. Those are your money makers. Let's make sure that we're training our legs hard enough so you can survive the whole season." Because what people don't realize is when you kind of skip out on some of this stuff, it kind of hits you a little bit in the middle mm -hmm. of the season. You, you know, you pull a hammy or whatever the case may be. So I always tried to place a huge emphasis, especially on the receivers and the guys that had to do all the running. you got to take care of your money makers. Like, yeah, we can probably skip a little bit of everybody, but, you know, you got to take some of those hits. But let's make sure that at least one day a week we're hitting those legs really hard. And Frank Gore is a perfect example of one side to the other. Like Frank Gore, like you couldn't get him out of the way. He's like, Coach, I'll meet you here on Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. And I'm like, Frank, dude, like I got to get a little sleep every now and then. Frank, <laughs> He wanted to do something every single day. And, and, and for what he's done, like he's, he got everything out of his body that he ever could. And he left a lot out there, you know, on those fields in the NFL. But he was a grinder, you know. And, and then you get guys like, like, you know, Sean Springs back in Seattle. It was probably between him and Joey Galloway were one of the more phenomenal athletes I'd ever been around. 
and Walter Jones and all those type of guys. There's so many phenomenal athletes that didn't make it in the NFL. And some of them will work really hard to maintain that. And some of them can let their thing drop a little bit. But it comes so easy to a lot of guys that it's not like, yes, they have to work hard. But I think sometimes they have to work harder at maintaining that staying in shape rather than getting out of shape and then getting back in shape, out of shape, in shape. So I always try to get guys to is, hey, let's stay in shape. Yeah, let's take some time off when the season's over with. But let's just do body weight stuff and let's build up to the off season. Let's kind of keep the train rolling opposed to gaining 30 pounds and trying to cut it off. So it's just that everybody's got a different personality and everybody's got a different philosophy to it. But I always try to just kind of dig into like, what works for you and try to tailor my work, my stuff around them. Hey, Darren, I felt bad bringing his name up, but we got to bring his name up. Brad roll. <laughs> hey, I love Brad roll. And I still talk to Brad roll. And if I don't know if y'all know, he had, sir, he, uh, he had cancer on his leg. Yeah. And he got it all taken out. And the last one he sent me, he had a scar from the back of his knee, like all the way up his butt. But I think he's on the road to recovery. I've texted him a couple of times, but, yeah, man, I love Brad Roll. Brad Roll is one of my dudes, man. I remember uh, just on Thursday mornings, I'll tell you a story on, on him. On Let me think about this. On Friday mornings, we would come in and lift, and we would knock on the uh, the coach's locker room, and he'd stay out so late on Thursday night, and he lived all the way down you know, in Brian almost, that we would knock on that door to wake him up, and he would ready to go but he probably got like two hours of sleep because he'd been out the whole night man i love brad roll and i but he and lamar was fortunate enough to have him up in Tampa. 12 years 12 years i had i had him for tw- i had him eight years in the nfl four years in college yeah so and i and check this out this is why i brought his name up i think i never gained a pound okay and the last two years of my career Check this out. The last two years of my career, I won a strength award for lifting in the weight room. I decided to lift the last two years of my career. Guess what happened those last two years of my career? I got hurt. Yeah, I got hurt. Okay. Really? Never, Your body yeah. wasn't used to all that mass. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I, gained, I gained weight. I thought I was a brick wall, a brick house. And I was just a straw house. And I just snap, 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 crack a pop on my bones. So. LT was the only Miami Hurricane in the school's history to have a, a weight room pass. He had, a, yeah. he had it around his neck. I had a pass. And he would just go right through it and come out the other side. Hey, you, know what, you know what was funny about Brad is Brad would, like, cuss him out so bad and, like, make him feel so bad. And Lamar would just walk out on the field and, like, he would do the 110. Like, I remember – like I like him and Horace Copeland, they would get to like the last. We do sixteen one tens, and the last like four to six of them, they were running diagonal to diagonal and still beating everybody else. <laughs> diagonal to diagonal, so they're literally running like one hundred sixty <laughs> yards. We're running one tens, and we're just barely making it. And those guys are like just like <laughs> just striding out like nobody's business. <laughs> fun days, the fun days. Hey, Darren, man, we we definitely appreciate you coming on the show, man. We definitely like to have you back again, and good luck to you guys this year. Win some games, and uh, man. you know, don't don't spend too much time in the snow, my friend. <laughs> Great talking to you guys, man. Anytime. Thank you guys for having yeah, me. Man. Thank you, Darren. Right, good seeing you again. Darren, All right, Brian. Be well. Um, stories, man. These guys. Wow, he's had you know. He's had some career. I, I never added it all up, uh, you know, obviously, until he was coming on the show tonight. But, I mean, he spent 20 years in the National Football League, mm-hmm. and uh, I hope he's got a nice pension from all that. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he should, right, Lamar? And, oh, yeah, uh, he should. Yeah. He should. And uh, the amazing thing is now he's 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 back in Colorado coaching at, at a high school in uh, – it's you know it's wild to see guys like make moves like that. I mean, it, it sounded like he kind of preferred to still be in the NFL. I don't right. know all the circumstances, but uh, still, you got to give him credit mm-hmm. for you know going back and doing what he's doing and helping kids. Sometimes it's family. Right? Wasn't didn't Chud didn't want to come down here because of family? We just, mm-hmm. And Lamar, you've kids, so you know. It, sometimes it's mm-hmm. just family. You just this yeah. is more important at a certain stage in your life than running mm-hmm. around all over the country. And especially being down here, I, I think for crying, man, he's such a 
such a good guy, man. I'm sure he really enjoys being out there and sounds like he's in a great spot. It's Christian high school. You know, can't have a coach like me. I have a little foul mouth sometimes, so I, I couldn't be employed. But uh, it probably sounds like a good deal out there, man. I'm happy for him. I always thought very highly of him. Uh, what a good guy. You know, him and um, – all the ends, Bill Hawkins, there was all those guys that played defensive being Anthony Hamlet, uh Rusty, uh, Rusty, and and uh what's my guy's name? Hawkins. No, I already said Hawkins. What's my oh, okay. I think the CT is getting to him. what's my guy's name that coaches at FAU right now? God dang it. KP. KP. I, KP KP will kill me if I didn't know his name. But yeah, all those guys, man, they, they just did their job. They rushed up field. They got a lot of sacks. They kept that quarterback in the pocket. Got a lot of great sacks I mean, from some great quarterbacks. You know, they weren't playing against Geno Toretta that, that, that couldn't move. We had to play against a lot of guys like Charlie Ward that could get out of in and out of there. And if you weren't uh, on, doing your job and you broke down, it would cause a lot of problems in our defense. And it, it didn't because we never had to worry about those guys doing that. They did their job. All right, let's take a few minutes here and uh, give some love to the guys that are uh, doing it up in the in the chat on uh, YouTube. Chris yeah. Fram, Lamar, he's in a conundrum, okay? Yeah. <laughs> he wants Frank Gore Jr. to do good. Don't ask me why. Mm -hmm. um, but then that might make us look bad at the same time. Is there a mm -hmm. conundrum there? I mean, Frank Gore, are you pulling for his kid on Saturday while also pulling for the Miami Hurricanes? Yeah, I don't even know what conundrum means, but um, <laughs> and I can't even spell it. But I, I tell you this: I, I, I just, uh, I, I want Frank Gore Jr. to do well. I mean, obviously, um, because I want him to transfer here next year. You know, because we have the cash flow. You know what I mean? And of, of course, uh, this this next guest can tell us all the things about the cash flow with you, Ruiz and all that other everything that's going on in the university. He's a Mister I Know It All guy. That's why I want him on the show, Kevin Harris. But I want him to do well, but not really that well. You know what I mean? I mean, but if he does well and we put up points, we throw the ball deep, we score a couple of times on deep passes, hey, what the hell? You know? You can get two touchdowns, Frank Gore Jr., and just come on down here next year, be wearing number three or whatever you want, whatever number you want to wear down. Yeah, well, you don't want him to get hurt, that's for sure. Correct. I'm not rooting for them, but you don't want him yes. to get hurt. And I, I, I don't want him to get hurt. Well, Antonio Antonio, I don't know if that's his real name. I assume it's not. I think he just likes his first name, so he uses it twice. Um, <laughs> he he says he's ready to see Chase Smith in, in, in action. And we talked about the linebackers earlier. And uh, Chase Smith did a phenomenal job, guys, on special teams in game yes. one. And it, it, I like I said earlier, I think him and Wesley Bersaint are two guys that have the capability to bust out here as the season goes on. So, uh you guys uh, excited about seeing Chase Smith a little bit on Saturday? Well, Mario, Mario brought it up that, you know, yeah, guys Mario like that, they get a great opportunity on special teams. And, you know, it's only human nature. Their names are being mentioned in that meeting room, uh, in the coach's room. And they're just like, hey, play him a little bit more at, at, his other, at his position. You know, play him a little bit more. He deserves it. He's making plays on special teams. That's how a lot of guys, when we were winning, got their names. Got their first starts. They were playing special teams and they were doing well. And all of a sudden, they get a chance to go in at linebacker a little bit more. And now they they become mainstays. Well, this is the game that you want guys like him and Wesley to play. You want to see them in action. You want to see what they what they're doing in coverage um, and, and and stopping the run and sealing the edge, things like that. That's what you want to see with these guys. And they'll play. I think they're going to play a lot because. They need to have a little more of a solidified defensive scheme going against Texas A&M. So this might be the last of the experiments, at least for a while. Yeah, they got to figure out who they can put on the field against right. Texas A&M, which brings us to our next uh, commenter on YouTube, Vike2004. He wants us to talk a little bit about DJ Ivy's struggles on game day. Mm. And uh, Lamar, uh, this is a great subject for you. The DJ mm. Ivy is, I believe he's the, it's, 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 it's either his fifth or sixth year right at the look, but mm -hmm. he's been in the program forever and has played a ton of college football. And mm -hmm. he's a guy that really excels on the practice field. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then something happens on game day where it, it, it doesn't quite come across the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. You were a coach. You are a coach. 
you have unquestionably dealt with players that have those type of issues and uh how like what's going on there like what how does that happen and what is there anything that could be done about it at this point or i guess at this stage of his career it might be it might be what it is yeah it's a it's a tough uh thing when you have a guy that you see him in practice he does everything well uh off season and he looks great you know, he looks, I mean, if you look at this guy, he looks like a pro player, you know, already, he's, you know, he's, he's physically fit, put together. And then all of a sudden he has these issues when he gets out there on the, on the, on the, in the, in the big lights, as Mario said, you, the big lights come on and things happen. Um, and I, I've seen guys, they go through on, on at receiver, they can't, all of a sudden they can't catch the ball. You know, they can't do other things. They're forgetting the plays, and you're just like, bro, what is going on? And for a lot of not, – not saying this is DJ Ivory, not saying this is happening, but I can tell you this. I've always told kids, if you're doing the right things on it, off the field, good things are happen for you on the field. If you're trying to be the best person that you can be, whether it's going to all your classes, uh, helping an old lady cross the street, doing whatever you need to do that's right – not being a bad person, going to your study hall, doing everything that way coaches are not getting on you about anything or your parents. You go into the game and you have a free mind. You know, I had, unfortunately, today's kids, they do a lot of, you know, a lot of reefer smoking, as we called it back in the day. And so it shows up. Not saying DJ Ivy. I'm just saying the kids that I've coached. I want to make sure people understand this. You know, it's just like, yo, bro, maybe it's the weed that's throwing you off. You know, maybe you need to cut back. Maybe you need to cut it out. You know, you come in my meeting rooms and I smell it. I send you to the locker room to go take a shower. You know, but then you go out there and you drop a damn ball and you wide open. Duh. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, you got to. If he's doing well in practice, then I don't think that's what's going on. I, I, I think I think he's a guy that doesn't have the quickness to cover the shorter guys or the fast guys. Mm-hmm. He's he's taller, he's a little bigger, mm-hmm. and he struggles against guys that are shifty. Now mm-hmm. he may not have a problem with you. You're taller, maybe not. Mm-hmm. But some of these other kids, he 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 goes for fakes and he whiffs, or mm-hmm. he bites on on fakes, out and ups or whatever, mm-hmm. and he, he's behind the receiver. So. I think part of the problem is either focus, concentration, or focus. he's just never really going to be someone that can cover other than just a certain type of receiver. Well, that might be right because, um, you know, there are certain types of guys, you know, uh, bigger guys gave me issues. You know, little guys, I felt like I don't care if you're Daryl Green or Terrell Buckley. I felt like I was better than you. But a bigger guy, he could be sorry. He would just give me issues. Because he was, he was, he had the same length I had, as right. far as me using my hands and arms to grab him or jump. You know, so they, they gave me, the, they gave me fits. But right. a smaller guy, I love going against smaller guys. I love to be on top of the helmets. So, <laughs> but DJ, man, I just don't know. I and it's, you know, he just has it all when you look at him. And you've seen him do some good things, but you've also seen him do some bad things. So I, I'm hoping that this coaching staff, because they are a very, they do have a very good coaching staff that have been there, have a lot of experience. Um, they can help him, and maybe it's a mental thing, you know. And today's games, they, they, they talk, they have you go talk to people. You know, back in the day, you didn't want to go talk to somebody because your next step was, they're probably gonna say you crazy or you missing something, and they're gonna kick you off the team. But today's yeah, kids, they want you to. How did Porter grade out? Do you know? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll have to look it up. I'll look it up in a minute. But the one thing I'll say about DJ is this is his, I guess, third coaching staff. And they keep putting them in this. Every staff keeps putting them in the starting lineup. So that, so that means he's showing something in practice. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean. When, who's his focus? I don't know. When, when you go to a practice and, again, like I've said, you go to a practice and you see us not being able to complete not one 50-50 ball. You know, he was he was doing his job, you know, but I don't it's just when the lights come on, something is something is a little off. I hope he gets it together. I hope this coaching staff is able to help him. I hope Mario 
and what he brings to the table gives this kid some confidence because I really want to see the kid do well. He's a great kid. I, I've talked to him a lot when I go down there. Yeah, he may be in the first half this week, but if he doesn't show anything, they're going to start looking for somebody that's going to be more consistent than him. The inconsistency is what's bothered him all for this entire career. Well, you know what happens? He gets a circle from the other team. They say, we're going after this guy. Yep. And so he'll get, he'll get his opportunities if he's in there, and hopefully he does well. All right. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about receivers. Lamar, mm-hmm. your favorite subject. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we've talked a lot about Restrepo, and Restrepo was obviously fantastic in the game. But first, I want to talk about Keyshawn Smith. He didn't get any targets in the offense, but he did bust out as a kickoff returner. And I want to show you guys something. Uh, his mom, who obviously is very proud, dug out some footage of Keyshawn returning kickoffs in Pee Wee Ball. Uh, Ooh, take, wow. yeah, take, take, take a look at this. Pee Wee Ball. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah, well, that's that a kind of look like it looked like Saturday, didn't it? Kind of looked like Saturday. <laughs> Same number. I think that I'll team might be a little story in a minute. He says he doesn't want to return punts anymore. <laughs> I think that I think that I think that team might be better than Bethune Cookman. <laughs> yeah, these are all punt returns, but Ooh. you can kind of see his ability as a kick returner mm-hmm. back then. Wow. Wow, that's Pee Wee. Looks kind of tall for Pee Wee. Here's, here's a kickoff return. Let's see what we got. Off the bounce. Here we go. Find the hole. Watch this move. Watch this. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Who's that? Little Timmy out there. Oh, hey, 20, 28 wanted no parts of it. Look uh, at this. Oh, what down. a block. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lamar, I mean, how amazing is it that he was showing as a kid the type of skills that we would end up seeing on a college football field? Well, the thing that he did, and as you saw in the film, he he hit. He, I mean, he didn't stutter. He just went and found the hole. I mean, on those kickoff returns, he found the hole. Obviously, he had the one little backup move. But on Saturdays, he hit the hole and he was gone. And uh, that's what you got to be able to do as a kick returner. You can't have any um, stuttering of the feet. You got to be able to hit that hole hard. Some of the best kick returners that I've uh, played against or were on my team were guys that just said, you know what, I'm hitting this hole regardless. And sometimes they get blown up. But the majority of the time, they get right through that hole before it closes, and now you got some issues, and uh, it becomes a big return. Now, we were talking to him a couple days ago, and he says, you guys will love this. He says, I would do anything for this team, anything, absolutely anything, but don't ask me to return punts because those guys are coming down. They get a free shot at you. I want no part of that. Uh, well, well I, we my first – catches if he wants. <laughs> My, my, my freshman year, um, we had a meeting and Coach Johnson said there's going to be some freshmen that are going to be able to, that we're talking about participating uh, on special teams like Lamar Thomas, who is going to return punts. I said, I, I kind of raised my hand and said, nah, Coach, them guys too big, Coach. I'm a red shirt. <laughs> No, and Daryl Spencer actually ended up doing it, and he ended up actually getting hurt his freshman year against Michigan towards knee up. So I was like, man, I'm so glad I didn't do that. I'm not saying that it would have happened to me, but I just felt like you get into college and you see this is not high school no more. You're not playing against uh, – you're not playing against Jacksonville, Reigns, Reebok, all these schools, or Orange Park. You're playing against uh, the real what big were boys. I was like, nah, I'm good. Were you buck 50 as a freshman? Uh that might be generous. <laughs> yeah, that might be generous. Jimmy picked you to return funds. Well, did I mean, I, I, I did it. I I did it in practice. Oh, okay. I did it in practice and because I did it in high school. But I started thinking, I'm like, man, hold on, man. Mm-mm. I don't know about this, man. They they these guys coming down full speed. I don't really know these guys that are supposed to be blocking for me. It's not like high school where I could beat them up. <laughs> put them in lockers. These are big guys, and let's say they miss a block, I get hit. I can't do anything. So I said, "Well, I, I just, I'll just take myself off of this. I'm, I'm on a red shirt." 
I'm 150 pounds, so I I have no choice. I'm gonna try to gain some weight, which didn't happen. It didn't happen. <laughs> so so Lamar, the whole offseason we've been talking about Miami's gotta find the number one receiver. Miami's gotta find the mm-hmm. number one receiver. Keyshawn is the name that came up as the guy that might have the best chance to do it. And he didn't get any targets in the passing game against Bethune. Um Josh Gaddis is is keeping the passing game under wraps here. Obviously, he's going to want to unleash it against Texas A&M. Um, but how significant is that performance, even though it came against Bethune-Cookman the other day, for Keyshawn Smith's confidence mm-hmm. level that when he does start getting targets in the passing game, that it, it will help him there? Well, again, watching the game from the end zone, um, I was able to see that they were they were bailing. So they weren't going to allow you to catch a lot of the deep routes. They were basically taking the deep routes away from you. They wanted you to catch things underneath, which is smart. They, they felt like they were outmanned in the secondary as far as our receivers. So they just said, hey, we're going to play cover three. We're going to bail on the outside. And if you throw hitches, you, so be it. But we didn't throw any hitches. I think we threw maybe two or three. Um, I, I, th- I really believe, like, when you have a good game like he had at returning kicks, there should be some carryover. There should be some carryover. You you not only scored, you had uh, another good return. I mean, there should be some carryover. It should do well for his confidence. The guys I'm, I'm more concerned about are the guys like Romello and all those other guys because I really want to see them be able to do some things uh, in the passing game downfield to be able to take some pressure off of guys like Mallory, and Restrepo uh, and open things up for everybody, you know. So hopefully this game, that's what I really want to see. Or maybe got, maybe Josh is saving it for Texas A and M. But they, I, I'm I mean, pretty he's sure he's saving it for Texas A and M. But the, but 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 I guess a, another question for for you would be: Can you do that? Can you have all this passing game that you've been working on in practice and wait until your big game to roll it out? Do you need to roll some of it out this Saturday? Yeah, I had the exact same question, Gary. The exact same question. Strategically, what's the way better way to go? I mean, for me, I would let them throw some bombs this weekend and let Texas A&M see it. See it. Because mm-hmm. you want to have them thinking, we better not put these safeties too far close mm-hmm. to the box because we're going to get burned, especially if we complete them. So if we save it, I don't know. And we don't even know if we're going to catch those balls. So I would do it this weekend. That's just my thought. Well, I'll tell you this, you know, again, it's, it goes back to what you, what you kind of said. I mean, you throw it, you give Texas A&M something to say, okay, we got to prepare for that. We got to, we got to, they, they want to go deep. Or the first game, they didn't show anything deep. They want to go deep. Now they're, they're practicing against stuff. They're trying to figure things out. And now it kind of opens up the things underneath. Also, the short game, the short, the quick passing game might be open enough. Uh, but remember, when you're playing against SEC teams, okay, those D linemen that they have are big. They're pretty big, and if and they're they're um, they're athletic, so you don't get much time to throw a lot of deep passes unless it's quick game. I mean, it's a whole I, – I, I love the ACC. I, I love what it brings to the table. But really, that SEC, man, it is a grown man's conference as mm-hmm. far as those guys up front. Well, and they're big that, and they can run. that big pass rush that they're going to have, yes. I yes. hope Restrepo's ready because we better start yes. throwing some balls into the flat because if yeah. they're coming after uh, Van Dyke, then he needs to be involved in the offense, especially in the flat. Yeah. I don't think you got to worry about that, Bruce. <laughs> that guy's involved he's in the getting, offense he's because he's, the when he gets out of bed in the morning, his roommate is the quarterback. Right. So, yeah. so, like, no, I, 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 meant, I meant Rooster. I meant Rooster. Yeah, Rooster will be Rooster. back. We should see yeah, that's right. Rooster this week. Rooster, right. That's that's right. He'll I'm, help out. He'll hey, help out. No doubt. No I doubt. don't think he's some of that big pass rush. LT, I got another one for you in that along those lines with the pass rush. How about Zion Nelson? We haven't seen a play of him yet this year. Uh, they held him out of the Bethune game. Uh, I don't know that John Campbell. I hope he's not listening. I hope his, you know, <laughs> I don't know if John Campbell can handle an SEC defensive end. Uh, you know, I mean, and I haven't studied A and M for to the degree where I've got the names at the tip of my tongue, but I know that they're strong on the defensive line. 
and they're going to have some good defensive ends. And uh, they need Zion Nelson healthy and ready in that game. Does he need to? Does he need to play this week and and get some game time in uh, before being ready? You know, ready for mm-hmm. Texas A and M becomes mm-hmm. an issue with him. Well, I mean, only if you're healthy. You know, only if you're physically fit enough to go in there and and and, uh, and improve and get some reps. If you if it's something off, you, you shouldn't because you got to be a hundred percent for the game that we all have circled. You know, I'm, and again, it's 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 not a knock on the team Southern Miss we're playing. It's just that the se- schedule is set up in a way where we've circled the Texas A&M game. But you missed training is- camp. Yes. You missed training camp. And now you've missed the first two games of the mm-hmm. year. Can you just walk out into Kyle Field in College mm-hmm. Station and be ready to play against an SEC oh. defensive mm-hmm. line? I don't know. You might have to miss this one. Yeah, I would say you have to Campbell play and have somebody help Campbell. That's what I would do. Mm-hmm. Because if, if, if he's yeah. not ready to play Zion Nelson, you got to go with, try to help out as best as you can. Because you can't put Zion out there with no game experience at all since last year. I don't see it. So these are all like little subplots that we're seeing develop here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we're only in week two of the season. And it's, yeah. it's really interesting. It makes the game um, – more interesting just to look at the little nuances and complexities but just remember now we point back to last year this time it was <laughs> what were we talking about the whole time go ahead bruce say it fireman yeah. it is fireman it is the other fireman Man Diaz. get rid of him already yeah that's what it was <laughs> and now we're just actually it was so obvious. i don't care you know i love you lamar but i knew you were straddling the fence there but man it was so obvious all the things it's obvious because you look at what mario's doing and you say right. why didn't these things happen when he was the coach because it wasn't capable of it it was way over his head it was way over his head and, and maybe man, and maybe he didn't have the coaches around him too like mario has brought in here the type of experience you know yeah he, they well, had, i don't know if it's true or not but he had a chance to bring in alonzo to help him out and he just said no now, that's the thing. Man, Manny wasn't going to bring anybody in of course not. that he perceived as being smarter or better than him. Mm-hmm. And guys that knew they were smarter and better than him were not going to come work for him. So it, right. it was a right. catch 22. Yeah, it was correct. a total mess. All right, Lamar, I'm going to do something cool here. Okay. All right. What we got? I, I am going to give you the entire screen, which what? I'm, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure makes you very happy. And uh, we're going to show everybody all the greatness of merchandise that you are surrounded by there at yep. Kingswear in Davie on University Drive, where they are going to open up on Saturday morning at 7 a.m. for the Seven. Canes fan. 7 a.m., yep, for the Canes fan that wants to come shop before the game. And then they're going to stay open till 7 p.m. so you can go by after the game to celebrate the Southern Miss victory. So, Lamar, talk to us, man. Tell us a little bit about what is going on at Kingswear. All right, here's my live read right here. Hurricane football is back. Are you geared up yet? Aha. Have you been to Canes where in Davie recently? They have the latest gear for the Miami Hurricanes and the Miami Dolphins too. Canes where is more than a store. It's an experience. They have the largest selection of Miami Hurricanes items in town. Items from Adidas, Dime Life, Flow Grown, and other brand names, including Team Sideline, apparel, and hundreds of different T-shirts, jerseys, polos, hoodies, and hats and all. Sizes for men, women, kids, babies, and even pets. Caneswear is your tailgating headquarters. Tents, chairs, tables, flags, decals, magnets, license plates, sunglasses, and tattoos. They definitely will get you ready for game days. So if you want Hurricanes gear or any South Florida pro team merchandise, they got you covered all season long. So get over to Canesware, located at 2511 South University Drive in Davie. And, of course, they're always open at Canesware.com. Canesware, the spot where Miami fans shop. That was pretty good. And uh, remind us who's giving you dinner tonight. 
Oh yeah. Uh this is dinner by uh let's see what we got. We got uh Mission Barbecue, Mission Barbecue right here. I got some uh pork sandwich here. Got a pork <laughs> sandwich, some fries. I got uh actually they got the hometown heroes. You buy this cup and it, uh you donate to the fire department and the police uh here. You buy these cups and I got oh some baked beans right here. Mm -mm. I'm gonna tear these up tonight. Hopefully, I, I'll, I'll probably be sleeping downstairs by myself. Um, <laughs> and I got some dessert. There we go. Got some dessert. I think this is some uh, cherry pie. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Thank you, Mission Barbecue. Oh, and I got some Southern Smoky Mountain barbecue sauce. And Mission Barbecue's right down the the plaza yes. there from Canesware. So that's right. Uh, I don't think they'll be open at seven o'clock on Saturday no, no, if, no. if you go that early. But maybe after the game, if you come yeah. back to Canesware and you yeah. go to shop, they'll be open. You can get a they'll get some open. barbecue to eat over over there at at, um, at Mission Barbecue. So uh, it's a good little two for one. Yeah, two for um, one. So uh, another one of the uh, sponsors of our Lamar Thomas show is. The law office of um, what do you mean of uh, Lamar? <laughs> help me out here. Uh, the, the, the the crawl let me down. No, Christine Rosendahl. Yes, um, it's law law office. Of Christine Rosendahl. Tell us real quick what kind of practice Christine has. Well, she uh, she does criminal. She does uh, DUI stuff. I mean, you know, obviously, again, you don't. You don't wish any bad on yourself. You don't want to go out the house thinking that you're going to get in some type of trouble. But it's always a good person to have her number. Actually, in my wallet, I have her business card on hand just in case. You know what I mean? Because you never know, especially in South Florida. People try and get crazy all the time. Look at this right here. I got it right here. Boom. Look at that. Christine Rosen, Rosen call right there. Esquire right there. Boom. There it is right there. Got the address, got the phone number, 561-512-6199. And go to the website, Christine Rosenthal. Uh, what's that? Esquire <laughs> at hotmail.com. That's her email. Does That's she have a email. website also? Yes, Christine Rosenthal. Uh, Esquire. Everything is Esquire. Dot com. You got to put that in there. Yes. Put that right. in there, and then you'll read about all the testimonies and all the good stuff where people will say, Hey, man, this lady is she believes in justice, I got justice, and she's fair, her price is fair. So, and we got her care. name on the crawl at the bottom of yes, the screen. So, yes, any of you guys out there that in, in South Florida that need an attorney to help you out, yeah. uh, give Christine a call. Uh, yeah. I'm sure she'll be she ha be happy to. Now, um, we got one other guy that wants some equal treatment. So yeah. uh, I'm going to, uh, we got another attorney in the house. His name's uh, Bruce Warner. So we're going to give him the screen, Lamar, yeah. because he has to talk about it. He wants to talk about a subject uh, near and dear to his heart um, that, you know, I, I, I know that it is to you as well. So okay, go ahead, Bruce, tell us a little bit about um, the emergence of paternity cases in your practice and how you're able to help people who might be having some of those issues. Yeah, well, Lamar knows, um, but I, I do family law, only family law, which is divorces and custody fights. But I've got to tell you, in the last 10, 15 years, it's been an epidemic that there are more fathers who have out of wedlock children who can't see their kids than in the first 25 years that I practiced law. I've been doing it 40 years already. And so if you're having problems with the mother of your kids and you're not seeing them, and you're paying child support, or if you're not paying child support, it doesn't matter. Under Florida law, an out of wedlock child belongs to the mother. The father could know he's the father, be on the birth certificate, it doesn't matter. You have no rights whatsoever to that child until you file a paternity action, you get an order of paternity from the judge, and you get a parenting plan, which gives you dates and times and weeks and summer and winter breaks and things like that. That's the only thing that'll get you to see your kids. So if you're having problems, you've got out of wedlock children or a child, call me 954-258-2525, 954-258-2525. I get calls almost every day for something like this. 
it is to me it's an epidemic and it's just wrong and it doesn't make a difference if they hate your guts and you hate their it doesn't matter you are entitled to have time with those kids but only if you file the paternity action otherwise you, you could bang your head against the wall she does not have to let you see them she can move to alaska and not even tell you guys again it was one or nine five four two five eight two five two five thanks gary all right so we take <laughs> we've uh we've taken care of business uh hopefully uh some of you guys uh if you, if you need help with any of those issues you've got uh, a couple places to go now and uh, like i said christine's name is on the bottom of the crawl you can look her up on the internet get her email address and and get her phone number and uh, and give her a call all right time to get back to football guys and in the green room we've got the guy that knows everything just ask him okay this guy is 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 the yenta of university of miami football alumni okay um he can uh, espouse on any topic whatsoever uh mm -hmm. that might uh be your fancy on a given day and tonight we are privileged to have mr kelvin harris join us here on the hey. lamar thomas show that he will now want to rename the kelvin harris show for the next 15 20 minutes um kelvin how are you buddy how you been i'm doing good how you doing we're doing good we're doing good welcome man welcome to the party in, in yep. honor in honor of bruce I, i'm wearing glasses okay good good you got you and you got um where the hell have you been from you know who down the corner around the street for me around the corner they want to know where you've been man i'm in fort myers i mean i know but you got to come over here they're asking hey, about you. hey hey i can't wait to get a couple of meatballs from sicilian oven <laughs> yeah. Kevin. And a carrot, all right sweet and a carrot cake and ice cream we heard about that oh yeah <laughs> all right kevin here, here we go man you're here you're on the show Tell us about these canes. This is what you this is what you live for. And and go ahead and tell us how we're gonna be 10 and 2 this year. So the, go the, ahead. I'm gonna say this the floor is 10 and 2. Anything less than that, and Mario gotta go. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my I told god. you he was crazy. It because every the last 10 years is 12 and 0. And he explains it to me like every year. Right, every year. <laughs> well, 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 I'll say this, I'll say this, guys. I look at our schedule every year and I say, are we better than this team? And talent wise, we are. But for the last 15 years, we've been peeing on our legs. Well, <laughs> we paid a guy $8 million. We're paying the, the coordinators a million dollars a piece. Ain't no more peeing on the leg. Mm. <laughs> if if, if we're going to do that, then we should just kept the last guy and save the money. Mm. So who? And, but 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 honestly, talking to, to 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 some of the kids that I talk to, they have bought all the way into everything Mario is selling, and it's like they unintentionally pushing Manny under the bus because it's like oh it's so different. <laughs> it's like wow, I mean they just they love the competitiveness of practice. Uh, they 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 don't mind being held accountable. Um, I still think we got a ways to go. There's still some. There's still some 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 remnants there that gotta gotta get rid of. But I mean, Mario's getting up at five o'clock in the morning every day. I mean, <laughs> he's gonna he's gonna he's got a great attention to detail. And I'm not, I'm I'm just like with Lamar. I mean, I play with Mario not just for the UM, but in the World League in Amsterdam. And this Mario ain't the Mario that was in Amsterdam. Matter of fact, I got an envelope. That I'm gonna send to him for blackmail purposes, so that I can put <laughs> money into an account. So, because I, I, I kept the negatives from Amsterdam, <laughs> the things that he don't want out. Mm. So, Kevin, I mean, the, the the fact that as I talk to you almost every day, yeah, yeah. You know, you you bring up. I talked to this kid. I talked to this kid. I mean, you got the phone numbers of these kids. What is the difference between you talking to them this year and you talking to them last year? What's the difference? They just seem more serious. Mm -hmm. I mean, they first of all, 
And now I'm fixing to push the man under the bus. They respect their coach a lot better this year than they did last year. No, no doubt. But there's a reason for that. He's accomplished things in his life. What did the other guy accomplish? Where could turn he... over chain, turn over chain, turn over chain. Hey, I'm gonna say this though. I'm gonna say this. I'm gonna say this about the turnover chain, Lamar. You know damn well you jealous. We ain't had that. <laughs> yeah, I am a little jealous because the could fact you imagine that, if we had? Yeah. Could you imagine if we'd had a turnover chain? Well, it would have been or a touchdown chain. It would have been at the club. It would have been. There's no way they could have kept it locked up. It would have been at Luke's on Miami Beach. Oh my God! Yes. I mean, it would have been all over, all over South Florida. Found it in some young lady's uh purse. I don't know. It would have been all. There's no hey, way we, they could have locked that thing up. We would have had some kind of little uh pot going. Like whoever won player of the game get the weather chain to the club that night. Oh my God. It would have been, been. It have been bad. It would have been bad. You would have needed replicas. I'll tell you that. Yeah, probably. <laughs> I mean, we had a, hey, listen, he, he he knows this. We had a kid that broke into Coach Erickson's Erickson. office and stole his cell phone. So yes. I could imagine if we'd have had a turnover chain, <laughs> somebody would have stole that thing. I think I know who you're talking about. It would, it was it was a, it would have been a bad deal, but I mean, the fact the fact that you know here it is. You talk to all these kids, and you also. If I'm not mistaken, you talk to who, who's the guy you always telling me about you talk to and you have the insights on all the things that's happened at the University of Miami, who was getting hired and all. what's the guy's name you talk to? Uh, Rudy Fernandez. See, Rudy Fernandez. See, I didn't even know the guy's name. That's yeah, your friend now. Uh, <laughs> see, yeah. Hey, I mean, he admitted he loves the podcast. So, hey, <laughs> friend of his, a friend of the podcast, a friend of mine. No, but. Rudy admitted to me that they took their eye off the prize. They basically, he broke this down to me. He said, we have three businesses that we run. We run the school, we run U Health, and we run the athletic department. And he said they have to be honest. They were honest with themselves. They took their eye off the prize, and they figured Blake was doing his job. Yeah, Blake wasn't doing his job. Nope. And honestly, Kirk Herbstreet put it all out there for everybody to see. And that's when they started paying attention. And when they started paying attention, it was like, hey, man, he got to go. <laughs> and then once he left, it was pretty much over for me. So so how did the, how the relationship start with you and Rudy? Because, I mean, did you stalk him, man? I mean, did you stalk the man? Because you, you have been known to stalk some people on campus. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to bring that up. But, uh, you know, there, there were some stories that should not be told. I, I'm that, not, Mario I'm not. Could, that Mario could rebuttal and get you on that. So go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I'm gonna let you make it on that one because I got some pictures of you too. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know now um I forget how I met Rudy. Um dang, I don't even remember. Yeah, and then I remember he came on the podcast last year, but I met him before that, and um, you know. He's as big a fan as the program as anybody. And he just, you know, he's just saying we um and, and actually I'm tell this story. I knew Manny was getting fired before he got fired because wow. one of my teammates from the Canadian League is a guy named Jason Medlock. Well, his son was committed to us, Justin. And so Manny was doing an in-home visit at the house in Houston. And so Medlock is calling me like, hey man. Justin Mama got a whole bunch of questions and, you know, Manny doing a good job, but I got some questions too. So he is peppering me with these questions and I'm texting Rudy like, hey, man, you got an answer for this? And I remember Rudy said something. He texted me back. He says, tell him to hold off until Monday. We're going to have an answer. And this was like a Friday. And I was like, Monday? And just so happened the Pac-12 championship game was that night. So I was like, oh, they about to go out the oh man, man, he fired. I knew right then. I was like, well, they about to go out to got go out to Cali and negotiate the contract. And then Mario say, yeah, they're gonna fire this man. And what is Rudy? What is Rudy's official title at the University of Miami? He's the chief of staff for President Fink. Frank. Frank, is that how you say it? Frank? Frank, Frank? I think it's Frank. Frank. Yeah. Frank, Frank. Yeah. So basically, after Kirk Herb Street put us on front street. <laughs> They start looking at it and they said, man, 
you know, Brett, President Frank said, well, he basically told Rudy and this other guy, I forget the other guy's name, y'all going to watch the program from now on. We ain't finna let this happen again because we look bad. Mm-hmm. So basically he has to kind of, you know, sit in the background and make sure everything. But then when they hired Radikovich, he told me a story about Radikovich. He said he ran into Radikovich at a convention and he just made a joke about, yeah, you know, you can come down here. And Radikovich said, okay. Mm-hmm. And they were like, whoa. So then they, and then he basically told them, he said, I ain't coming unless Mario come. Mm. And so they had to go back and Mario was like, well, all right, I'm coming. And so they got a two for one. Wow. Hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, man, he never stood a chance. <laughs> he never stood a chance. No. Nah. Nah, wow. Nah, not with all these former players acting the way they are, but at least now you, you, you everybody should be happy. And I don't know what the record is going to be, but I'm going to be thrilled no matter what because we got the right people. I'm not going to be thrilled no matter what. No, 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 no. I'm not, I'm not four and eight, but I'm, you know what I'm saying. If we go 10 and two, I'm not going to cry. No, 10 and two with an ACC championship. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> I mean, well, hey, I, hey, I, got Mount, I got Mountain Dew in here. I'm glad this is just Mountain Dew. <laughs> hey, all four of us watched Clemson play the other night. Yeah. Hey, hot garbage. That number 11 big. Hey, he won't be back next year. <laughs> their, de- their defensive line is pretty good. Their defensive line is real yeah. good. And the two linebackers, 20, 22 and 0, are really good. Their secondary, eh, I mean, Lamar could probably beat one of them right now with a bad hip. Uh, I got a new hip. It's new. I'm good. With Uh-oh. It. Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> so we can throw you the nine route. Calvin, day, so tell us about day. tell us let's skip the next game. Tell us about AM because you, you you and I were on the phone for an hour last week. He, he's I not, have a I have a former he's teammate. He's not wrong. I have a former teammate I played with in the arena league. His son is their top receiver, a kid by the name of Nia Smith. He's number zero. So me and him been talking noise all summer long. But to, to that point, last year they had they were at a crossroads because the kids were about to turn on Jimbo on offense because they say he just he was too vanilla. Mm. And so then when the quarterback went down, they were having problems. So I remember having a conversation with Maurice and I say, yo, and, and I was on the phone. I say, yo, uh, you play running back, too, right? He says, yeah. I said, well, why don't you get the running backs and the O-line together with this quarterback? And me outside of the 20 hours. I said, I said, that's the problem with you kids. Y'all just do the minimum, but expect the maximum performance. I didn't think they'd take my advice, but they did it. And what? the kid got better as the year went on. But then the kid got paranoid because he said, Well, Jimbo don't like me. So he transfers to Auburn and he don't win that, he doesn't win that position. So now he's a second string quarterback at Auburn. You know, mm-hmm. but AM has um they got decent skill players. They got this A-chain kid who's real fast. He's a track guy. He's a 10, 10.0400 meter guy. And then they got Anias. Um, they lost their best outside receiver. He dragged, he basically beat some, he beat his girlfriend up and they kicked him off the team. Mm. And they they got a true freshman kid that's decent at wide receiver, but they're young. I mean, this is a this is a 50-50 game. This is a like a statement game for our team, but it's also a statement game for AM. And let's just be honest, what does AM ever want? Mm. Well, they lost four last year, and that but they beat Alabama. So they lost four games and it wasn't to Alabama. That's not well, so- you know what's crazy? Jimbo held out a whole bunch of plays just for Alabama. Mm. Of course, but- there's no game he'd rather win than that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but Nick, Nick, Nick gonna be waiting for him this year. Oh yeah. Nick, if you think Nick ain't ain't put that in his little, you know, to do list after <laughs> that, because you gotta remember Jimbo talked noise to him. And he beat him. Oh like, yeah, that's right. Hey, and he hey. talked noise all off season. So if you think Nick ain't, yeah, oh, yeah. If you if you an Alabama player that week, yeah, he gonna go y'all extra hard. But they're a beatable team. I mean, hey. they got a bunch of young defensive linemen. They got a they got a pretty good uh, a linebacker and their secondary is all right, but it's A and M. But 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 listen, Kelvin, how are we skipping Southern Miss? 
I mean, because they hot this, garbage. Listen, oh we could God. start. We could start Bruce and Gary at corner, and we would still win by fifty. <laughs> You mean Derek Bone out there? <laughs> if I get a pick six, I'm taking my helmet off, Lamar. <laughs> and, and, and you got no head, crazy. dog. And, and then here's the crazy part: they best quarterback is they is their best running back is Frank Gore's son. They had to bring him in as a wildcat quarterback last week. Yeah, they're they're not. I mean, but they're over. We can't. We can't. We can't. Forget we can't jump games, man. No, no, you know, I totally agree. There, there, there's some there's some teams like you know the Long Beach States. You know you got to play a lot against Long Beach State because you were basically a backup. Okay, <laughs> so um, these, these are games that you guys look forward to. You know, as a, a starters, a starters. Uh, well, actually, we, did, we got was, in, did our job. And- that was my senior year. Actually, you know what I remember from that week? I remember on Monday. Coach Jerson came in and said, hey, if y'all ain't up 49 nothing at halftime, I'm going to run the hell out of y'all next week. We were like, 49 nothing." Then I remember we went into the to the meet room and watched them. It was like, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> he right. <laughs> hey, there's nothing wrong with a backup. Gary, didn't uh, Claude tell us that Mario was his backup? So well, I believe that is correct. He, he said that. Claude what said that Mario at one no. point. Uh, Mario, Mario, you was, um, what was Claude's last year? Mario, Mario, and um, Mario oh, and Claude played on the same side my senior year, right? Because I had Rudy as a weak guard, and they put Leon with Rudy because Rudy was clueless. So, <laughs> Rudy Barber, by yeah. Barber, so, right? Leon was basically babysitting Rudy and Claude. And uh, Mario were the strong side. Like they moved Claude to guard. Right. Well, Claude Claude always played guard. Claude Claude would never tackle. Claude was always guard. I mean, when your nickname is Rhythmless Nation, come on. Yeah. And you look like a turtle. And And yeah, you had a turtle. You know know, where? Why I I covered him when he was the Dillard High, and he wasn't tackle. he was a tackle in high school, right? He He got shorter when he got to college. Yeah, he was he six shorter. four when he was at Dillard, and he got shorter. After well, that. well, he was six four until he met Mark Caesar, and we know we we know what happened. If any of our teammates out there, then we know what happened. Uh, yeah, so he shrunk. Okay, so Caesar got in the fight with Mario. Huh? In the Caesar got in the fight with everybody. Big yeah. Lou, yeah, Big Lou broke it up. Yeah, Caesar got in the fight with everybody. Oh, you know. Yeah. Not, not a big man. That's it. That's the blood, Newark blood. That's what happens when you come from a place like that. You yeah. Know? Yeah, you know, please, well, you know, Caesar was angry because he never had a grocery store to go to when he was growing up. Because you know, in in Newark, there are no grocery stores. I know. <laughs> Tell me about it. I know. <laughs> hey, hey, Kevin. Okay, so all right. So you're gonna pass over Southern Miss. So yes, I am. What other? What other? What are the teams on our schedule should we be a little worried about? What do we play UNC? I mean, what, what, what's, what I'm, I'm gonna say got? this: you UNC didn't impress me, but I think they're gonna play us tough. Mm. Um, Pitt, but Pitt's the last game of the year and it's at home, so. Mm-hmm. Usually when they play us at our place, they don't play us as good as when they play us at their place. Mm -hmm. But they got a pretty good ball club, so you can't count Pitt out. We're going to find out a lot about them this weekend. They play Tennessee at home. Um, What are we going to find out? Just if they're – if they can – you know. Who said Tennessee was any good? Tennessee's a decent team. They're not great. But Tennessee was decent team, Calvin. Tennessee would be top three – we're four team in the ACC. SEC, SEC. In the ACC, yeah, they would. There's no doubt. I mean, look, I say this: they're going to be improved because they got their quarterback back for another year, and they and and this is their second season under that 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 system that um the, the guy runs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're uh, they're going to pit Kelvin as six and a half point fo- uh, road favorites. Who mm-hmm. is? Tennessee, yeah, oh, wow. I, I can see that because it's SEC and Pitt didn't really look that good the first week. 
Right. No, they they looked okay. They just, you know. I mean, to be honest with you, I can't be mad at the wide receiver for leaving because I guess after he saw Keaton Sl- Sl- Slovis throw the ball a couple of times in practice, he's like, "Oh no, I'm not finna let him." No, it ain't gonna work. <laughs> hey, Kelvin. Okay, so check this out. Yeah. We got about ten minutes left in the show, but I want—I just want to know one thing. What was? And I want to make sure I, I have this correct. What was your favorite, or not favorite? What was your your wear? Your wear going to class. What was? What did you wear going to class? The same when you thing went to you know. <laughs> When you went to class. This, this, when you went to class, it was the same thing you wore. Grays. Grays, cut off t-shirt. No, 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 no. Actually, I got I got kind of stylish with it. My senior, I'll have grades with like an eyes out. Oh. Well, see, Kevin was known as a guy that he never you never saw Kevin outside of issued gear. Okay. Never. <laughs> well, no, 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 no. There were times. Maybe remember, the club. Mike, remember Mike Short would, would do them raids where he would take all the grades back from us. Yes. And then we would have to spend about two weeks stealing them back from him. <laughs> <laughs> man, we had a lot of fun back then, man. Hey, listen, bro. Hey, Tell I talked to Short bit. today, man. You, t- I, you I talked to Mike? Yeah, yeah, man, I talked to him today. <laughs> he well, how's he doing? Day. He's doing good. He said whatever um, health issue he had is better, and he living mm-hmm. in L.A., so that means he probably got him a 25-year-old girlfriend spending all his money. <laughs> Hey Kevin, tell us a little bit about your show, man, before you go. Yeah, I do. I do a part. I actually just got through taping it, the U podcast. I got the kid from WVUM, Cal Freeman. Um, Cal's an intern with us. Great kid. Great, great kid. Great kid. And we we were talking about the game. I'm trying. I was like, I, I'm trying to get in touch with um Frank Gordon for my back in the day segment, you know, but. Man, I'll he's been laying number. low ever since that little incident he had. So I'll give you his number. Oh, you got it? Yeah, I'll give it to you. Okay. Yeah, because I mean, this is a this has got to be a bittersweet week for him. I mean, your yeah. alma mater, but then your I think the best the best of both worlds would be is for his son to have a hundred yards rushing and for mm-hmm. us to run him out the stadium. That'd be great. <laughs> which run probably, the ball. Which probably might happen. Well, it was funny. I was telling these guys earlier in the show, we did an interview with them, and Frank starts out saying that he wants Miami to win, uh, and he just wants his son to have a good time. Then he realized that he was saying he wanted his son to lose, so he kind of said, no, wait, no, no, I, I, like, I, just want to, I just want him to have a good time. <laughs> well, he, he got to be real with himself. They don't have a chance. But <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. His son going to get the ball. He's going to have about 30 touches. No doubt. Mm-hmm. They don't have anything else. Right. I mean, they could put you and Bruce out there, and I'm y'all ready, more man. effective than they wide outs. I'm ready. Hey, <laughs> hey Kevin. Uh, ready. One of the one of the two twenty five hurricane is probably your cousin. He says Kevin should be on more. We'll have you. On, we'll have you on more. Um, you know, we appreciate you uh, coming I'm, on tonight. Uh, I I'm will, being I representative. Was, I just want you to know that Robert Bailey represents me, and I'm gonna need oh to send my rider over and let y'all negotiate with him. All right, we, we need to, we we need to tell that, Robert Bailey to leave leave the play. I'm like, there are so many agents around these kids now. They're no, they're marketing no, agents. They're marketing. Okay, they're marketing, marketing agents, whatever. Marketing. But like, isn't it a conflict? Like, they're gonna try to get all these kids to leave the program early. It's like. Look at Rams. Well, actually, Rams. actually, you know what? No, because now think about something. Like, let's take the kid from um, um, Ohio State, the quarterback. He gave out a five hundred dollar gift card to the whole team. Yeah, I mean, that means he's sitting on some real bread. If you oh, pay he's getting it. paid, no doubt. I mean, you got kids. Well, let's just take our quarterback, Tyler Van Dyke. He's already got over a million and a half dollars in NIL money. So. Mm-hmm. If Are you his sure? Trip, is it that much? Did, yeah. It, has it gotten yeah. that high? Wow. Yeah. So if – well, you know what's crazy? Um, De'Aaron King made over $2 million last year. Mm. Who's giving you those figures, Calvin? Um, with Kool-Aid De'Aaron, so? Because people are throwing around crazy figures that just uh, – No, with De'Aaron, 
with the Eric, the reason why I know, and actually is as ironic, I was just talking about Anaya Smith. Well, like I said, him and his daddy, we played together in the, in the arena league. And Maurice was telling me the guy that got uh De'Eric, his money was trying to get Anais to sign on with him, and he basically was telling him all the money he got for De'Eric. And so when he told me that number, I was like, What? They lie. I'm telling you that a lot of these agents lie. Yeah, when, lie. When, uh, when Jane Rashada came to Miami, the, the agent out in LA said he's gonna make nine million dollars to go to Miami and put this out to try to get attention on himself. And it wasn't Jade Rashada's NIL deals her aren't even in that str- not even in that stratosphere. At this well, point. I could tell you right now, um, the way he laid it out to him, this was pretty credible. And then you know what's ironic, um, you know Lamar is coaching the XFL. Mm-hmm. If if they don't pick up um, um, the Eric, text the, the the Houston team will, and he'll probably make some endorsement money from Tim and Fertitta who owns all these restaurants. Actually, Derek told me this. He, he said that when he was getting ready to transfer from Houston, Tim and Fertitta brought him over to the restaurant and they had a meal because he owns like five, six restaurants in Houston. And he also owns the Golden Nugget Casino in Vegas. And he told Derek, he said, hey, I know you want to leave, but if you stay, I'm going to make you a millionaire next year. He laid it out to him. And he still left. And I was thinking to myself, what was he thinking? <laughs> All right, Kelvin, you've, you've overstood your time. Now, I knew you were going to do it because you love to talk. <laughs> but listen, uh, one of the one of the, the last thing, one of the uh, viewers asked, what's your podcast name? The You Podcast, presented by Truest Financial. Got to throw a All shout right. out to Tony Coley. Yeah, uh, Tony Coley. Yes. Well, we appreciate you, man, before you get another – Breath of wind to talk for 20 more minutes. All right, we got to get you out of here. We hey, love I'm gonna you. Send, I'm going to send you them negatives and I, I'm going to send you an account number. So I'm going to send you Frank Gore's number too. All right, bro. <laughs> I, I, I talk to you soon. All right, get him man. off your head. Right, I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll talk to all you right, soon. I'm, now, Gary, now you know where I got all those numbers from. People for, are like, throwing around like, like these are a lot of these marketing agents, as Lamar calls them. Mm-hmm. They throw around so many numbers because that's how they market themselves. Like, mm-hmm. hey, I can get you money. Like, I, mm-hmm. you know, I'm a really good NIL agent and stuff. And this guy out in LA that that's representing Rashada, he is like the master of it. He is mm-hmm. throwing around more BS numbers right. and how much money he's making for kids. And he he goes, he approaches the media to get the media to write about him, and he's using the media to promote him. And, um, but I mean, make no mistake, these kids are all, you know, they're all making money. They're getting paid. Um, right. and you know, like a Tyler Van Dyke is going to have, you know, he's going to have to weigh at the end of the year, his draft status against, uh, what mm-hmm. he can make NIL. And, mm-hmm. uh, I don't know if he's up to 2 million yet with the Rosenhaus agency I'll have to ask, but, but, um, whatever he's making now, if he comes back, he'll make a lot more uh, a year from now. And if wow. he's not going to get drafted in the first round and like Justin Might Herbert, well, say. well re- Justin Herbert went back for an extra year before there was an IL mm-hmm. and it paid off. He was at the top mm-hmm. of the draft and made big money. So uh, that'll be something for us to talk about in December, I guess. But uh, yeah, these, 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 these marketing agents are, 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 a lot of them are, you know, just inflating numbers to promote themselves. Um, they don't have to back it up. There's no, nobody sees the contracts. You know, Nobody. yeah. So, um, all right, LT. Uh, let's uh, let's take a moment here and one more time uh, pay homage to our friends at um, Canesware. And uh, I'm going to queue up that brand spanking new great commercial that they have created for the show. Welcome to Canesware. Family owned and operated since 2010, Canesware has all the latest merchandise for the Miami Hurricanes, Miami Dolphins, Inner Miami Soccer, and more. Come visit us at our store in Davie on University Drive, just south of I-595, or online at canesware.com. Canesware, the spot Miami fan shop. I like that. I like that. It reminds me of like Bethune Band and 
Not our band, no. though. <laughs> hey, um, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I'm looking forward to the game because I'd like to see some of the improvements that we talked about. We, I want to see the adjustments that they make. I want to see Keyshawn involved in the offense. I I, I don't know if Rooster's going to play. Do you know, Gary? I, I, he was expected. Yeah, okay. yeah, they haven't said definitively, but I think he's going to play. I want to see the young linebackers, and I want to see the, the front four do a better job in what they're supposed to do, and, of course, the secondary. So I guess most of the stuff is on the defensive side of the ball. I want to see improvement, and that'll make me feel better going into the A&M game. All right. All right, Bruce. All right, Bruce. Well, uh, we'll uh, see you Saturday on the yep. uh, post-game show, also presented by Kingsware. Yep. I'll be up at, like, the crack of dawn. <laughs> All right, Bruce, man. All right, Bruce. Thank you guys. Be well. You got it, man. All right, LT. Let's uh, bring this thing home. Yeah, with, baby. Uh, a little word association. Um, hey, what we got? Let's start with Xavier Restrepo. You know, he had a good game to start the season off. Uh, it's going to get tougher for him. But I believe in this kid's work ethic. Um, what's the thing is going to be the problem is if teams say we're going to take you, we're going to take him away and double or, or somehow shift the defense to stop him. So, but I believe he's a smart enough player that, uh, and he'll do whatever he has to do. I, I love watching him out there on the field. He runs around, he blocks, he does it, the little things. So, you know, as, as long as he's playing and in the game, I think that gives the defense an issue as far as, they know that he can be and will be a safety blanket for the quarterback. How about the way they're already moving him around? Sometimes he's in yeah. the slot. Sometimes he goes outside. Uh, there, I, I assume that's an effort to not let yes. these opposing defensive coordinators coming up here hone in on mm -hmm. defending him and and you know making it tougher on them to double team him. All good coordinators know how to move their guys around. The, the ones that are terrible are the ones that keep them stationary. And now <laughs> the defensive coaches can get a bead on them. But uh, that's I, Josh did a good job in this game. Obviously, he didn't show a lot, but he showed enough. And Restrepo got a deep, you know, you know, we talked about him being a, a, a possession receiver. He went a little deeper than possession. So, you know, these are things that's going to brighten his horizon on the game. All right. Let's talk a little bit about Frank Gore Jr. Frank Gore Jr. I mean, hey, what I'm hoping is that, you know, in the fourth quarter, he gets 100. He gets that 100. He goes over the century mark, and maybe the fourth quarter, we win it by – we win it handedly. You know, his yards per carry might not be great, but he gets, he goes over 100, and then he has a great year after that. And, uh, you know, next year he's wearing a University of Miami uniform. That's what I'm hoping. Because the kid <laughs> can play. So obviously, unfortunately – what Miami fans don't realize is that all these guys that they're recruiting, you can't get them all. No. And so sometimes you have to put a guy on the back burner, even though he's legacy, you mm -hmm. know, uh, you, you would think that and you would hope that they take care of legacy, but at the same time, they also got to try to win ball games. So, but the rules are such now a guy can go to another school and he can come back. So that's a beautiful thing. So don't give up on the guy. I hope he does well. No, I don't want to get hurt. I want to do well. I want to blow out, but I hope he does well, and we'll see him next year in a Canes uniform. Well, they're going all in on uh, a kid by the name of Mark Fletcher at American mm -hmm. Heritage. They're trying to flip mm -hmm. him from Ohio State. Um, if they don't get him and they don't have a running back in this class when we get to December, it would not shock me to see Frank Gore go into the transfer portal and come to Miami. Yeah. I mean, he, he, will, the, he will have earned his way here, just mm -hmm. similar to the way Henry Parrish has. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But so, I, I, I tell you this, that, that Mark Fletcher, man, that's a big kid, man. Jesus Christ. Yeah, he really is. I, man, that's a man child out there. Woo! Yeah. But this is a big game for Frank Gore Jr. on yes. Saturday. Yes. This, yeah, this big might, game. It might be a tryout, Lamar. Mm -hmm. And you know what? <laughs> We might we might be worried about if he does well. We might not just be worried about him coming to Miami. He might be anywhere else, Ohio State, somebody else, you know. So yeah, I just want him to do well. But I, you got, I, I got to think of Miami Watson. He'll come here. Though. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. 
just like Henry did. You know, it made sense. Yes. All right, let's talk a little bit about another guy from South Florida, mm-hmm. Andres Borregales. What, what is I mean? 11, 11 for 11. 11, 11, 11 for 11. The average start position for Bethune Cookman was a 25. Put him in the end zone. Our average starting position was a 46. We won field position because put the balls in the end zone. You know, only one was could have been returnable, but he did a great job. I mean, that's a weapon to have uh, today's age because you think about it. If Bethune Cookman's kicker kicks it in the end zone, he kicks it deep enough. Number five doesn't get returned. Yeah, those two returns. So you know, it's it's a weapon, and, and anytime you have a kicker with that type of leg, that leg strength, nowadays, hey, start him at the twenty-five. Let's see what happens. All right, let's take it home um, with a receiver, Keyshawn Smith. Keyshawn. You know, want to see you do well. I would love to see this week you be able to catch some some deep pass. Not just you, but number zero and the rest of the guys. You know, I always say, uh, I know Romello, but I always say to those receivers, you know, I don't know your name until I see you catch something deep or I see you make some plays. You know, and that's the way I kind of – because that's – in South Florida, that's how it was with us. They didn't know your name until they saw you make big plays. Now, it should happen this weekend. They, that you know, I don't, I don't think Southern Miss is going to come in here and play cover three. They're probably going to challenge because they got to get themselves ready for their own conference. So they're going to do some things, and if it's not in your DNA to do that, you can't change, and and it'll really screw you for the year. So it should see some challenges. There should be some opportunities for us to get some deep passes today uh, on Saturday. So I'm looking forward to to seeing what happens. All right, LT, another show in the books. Um, let's thank the law office of Christine Rosendahl. Obviously, yes. let's thank Canesware for hosting you and being the presenting sponsor of the show. Uh, Darren Crime, got to give him a shout out. Great uh, guest in our first hour. Uh, Kelvin Harris um, brought it. Sweet now- nasty. Sweet nasty. That's what we <laughs> called him. <laughs> I'll tell you why later. <laughs> uh, we got to thank him for joining us in the second hour of the show. Uh, got an early wake-up call for Saturday morning. The Canes and uh, Southern Miss at Hard Rock Stadium. Uh, kickoff is at noon. Canes Walk, which has been building in popularity, should be at about uh, 10. But if you're going to be there, I'd be there by 945. Mario gets the team to the stadium a little bit earlier than um, uh, Manny did. And uh, it'll be interesting to see the Canes put together another stepping stone here uh, towards – what we all know can't be understated for September 17th. It will be the huge topic of discussion on the Lamar Thomas show next Wednesday night. Uh, that road trip to College Station, Kyle Field, Texas A&M, one of the more unique venues in, in college football. Um, Lamar, you would have loved it, man. They, 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 everybody kisses there at, at certain points of the game. So they have this like this whole kissing thing. We'll talk about it next week. I'll, I'll bring you some video. <laughs> You'll love it. Uh, uh, might be sent by the wrong person. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's going to do it for tonight's show. We'll see everybody at The Rock on Saturday. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Go Canes. <laughs>